happy Sunday. I see there's a large crowd here, so I'm excited about that. I think there's a lot of interest in the Maura Murray case because after all, this is really the first case that became the social media you know, explosion of uh, cold case crimes. So consequently, it's been out here for years and people, it's not been solved. It's a very cold case. And so people are still ruminating over it. And it's going to be really interesting because I'm gonna bring out all the points about some of the problems with social media media in general, and cold cases. So, oh, <laughs> thank you, Annie. Oh, I, I love that. Thank you. Annie is saying, I can see and hear you. And anybody who comes here regularly knows that that's the first thing I ask because during my first show, I was like neither heard nor seen. I was like one of those little children they used to have in the past who were supposed to be in the corner. And <laughs> so it is great uh, that all of you can hear and see me because otherwise a show is pointless. So there we go. So <laughs> Pink Lilac says we're well-trained. <laughs> yeah, you know, I try not to make it a waste of time for people. So I do appreciate everybody popping in right away. And uh, how would they, oh, you made it. I made it to the live stream. Yes, you did. And so we have folks here from around the world, including uh, New Zealand, which I think is just so cool. Uh, New Zealand, by the way, is like, what is it, like 5.30 in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning? So either you're an early riser or you're crazy. I don't know which one. But all right, let's get to it because there's a lot to talk about here. And I'm going to try to put it in a form. Well, I'm just going to start and we're going to see Denmark. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Marianne. I'm going to talk about Denmark in this program. So hang in here because I have something very funny to talk about. And you can, if I could only hear you, you would be able to correct my pronunciation on Copenhagen and Abuslund and a few other places. But I lived there for six months during college. And that's going to be in this program today. So this is so cool. So Marianne, welcome. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Anyway, let's get started. Okay. First of all, Let's just talk about what happened to Maura Murray, the basics, so that anybody who's here who's never heard of the case will get the point. All right. So Maura Murray, I'm going to go to my usual Wikipedia thing because it's easiest. Um, she um, disappeared on February 9th, 2004. So we are talking, I can't, I can't count. Okay, that's almost two decades ago. No, so that's a long time ago. Um, and she, uh, what happened was she left the university campus. She was at Amherst in Massachusetts. Um, this was on a Monday. She let her uh, professors know that she was going not to be available. She kind of lied and said somebody in her family had died to get her off the hook, I suppose. Uh, she packed up some stuff and took off. And later that evening, uh, there was a, she crashed her car in New Hampshire. And then after a few moments of that, she vanished and was never seen again. So pretty weird crime. But the interesting thing about this crime is how out of control it got because of social media and the major media. Um, and I'm going to go through that. And I'm also going to give my analysis as I go so that you can see where I think people are becoming obsessed and, and going down uh, rabbit holes. They don't need to be going down and how this really isn't a great advantage to the family. So let's let's start with some just basics about this case, and I will then bring in what some of the issues are. Well, first issue is okay. I'm going to go to. Hmm, I will go to the people who are involved. That I'm going to talk. Oh, before I do that, I want to point out the difference between doing something on true crime. Uh, there's three different ways. One way for true crime is that you have experts like myself talking about a case, talking about the issues, the evidence, the analysis, and we just focus on the case and that's about it. We don't inspire people to go chasing people down or gathering more information. We're just here to help you understand because we are professionals in the field and we want you to understand the world around you and how crime happens and how investigations go. And what we do as profilers and as detectives to try to figure out who, who did it so we can catch people. That's my whole purpose. And there's a group of people who do that. And I, I pointed out previously on YouTube, I put some links to a, a few other channels, which I believe qualify in the sense that they are experts talking about 
of specific cases and teaching us. Now, we don't always agree with each other. You know, we don't because experts can disagree. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't have some respect for each other and want other people, people, all of you people, to be able to get differing opinions and learn different methodologies from those people in the field. So that's one group. The next group, and I want to talk about this because a lot of people think I'm super anti this particular group. And this is, this is the group. This is true crime shows that are very, very, very popular. And I'm sure almost everybody here knows Crime Junkie, which is just insanely popular. And they do podcasts. And there are two ladies, um, I forgot their names, but they have wonderful voices and they talk very nicely. And, and you know, I totally get why people enjoy going to uh, Crime Junkie. Uh, now, over here we have, let's, let's see, let me, let me get this straight. Her, her show is called, it's on YouTube, it's called Murder, Mystery, and Makeup. And her name is Bailey Sarian. Um, and she starts out with no makeup on. And as she tells a story with candles behind her, uh, it seems to be a candle thing here because both these ladies use candles. I don't know the candle thing, but it's pretty. And so she puts on makeup. She starts out pretty, just plain person. And then she does makeup while she talks. And she looks gorgeous at the end. And as you can see, I'm not going to do that so because <laughs> I can't do makeup. Um, but she does one case per one show per case. Um, and she talks very nicely. She's, she, she has a great voice. She's a good presenter and people watch and they enjoy hearing about how the crime went down and what happened. Occasionally she probably gives her opinion on something and I may disagree with it and think, okay, I, you know, you're, you know, maybe you're not an expert to analyze the evidence, but you're, you're, you're free to give an opinion. I don't have an issue. It's not my kind of show because I don't do true crime shows, but I get it. She's a good presenter and she's got like, what is she? I like 5 million subscribers. <laughs> so she's well liked. Well, she doesn't bother me in a, in a negative sense that she addicts people to one particular case and then encourages those people to go after other people, to, to believe they can solve the case. And they, they start ruminating over every tiny little piece of information true or not true. And then they, they start attacking people online. And then they, some of the people show up in person and start attacking the people in person. That to me is unethical and revolting. She doesn't do that. She just tells a story. So I'm okay. And over here we have uh, Kendall Ray. Uh, she does a similar thing. She's got about two and a half million subscribers. Again, nice voice, tells a story. If you want to just learn the basics of a crime and she takes you through it very nicely. Both of these ladies will take you through the entire crime better than I would as far as a story goes. And so, well, Crime Junkie, I don't tell stories. I just point out the points. Um, now, so I have no problem. And in below, in the links, you will find link. Uh, I linked to Crime Junkie and I've linked to these two ladies, Murder Mystery and Makeup uh, with Bailey and, and uh, Kendall Ray. I've linked below because I don't object to people going to their channels because I don't think they're unethical. Okay. There's only one problem I have, and this is what I want to point out to you right away. Because when you go to these channels, you are hearing a good story and getting kind of the, an idea of what went on, but do not get confused that you're getting necessarily actual I want evidence that the evidence that they're presenting is actually true evidence or that there may not be other explanations for things. So like for crime junkie, uh, someone I know dearly recommended crime junkie because she loves the show. And she said, you got to listen to crime junkie and tell me what you think, but don't go to the Madeline McCann case <laughs> that they did. And she told me that because of course I've written a book on Madeline McCann uh, and I know the case very intimately. So I did go right away. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to listen. I went right away and I listened to the, the crime junkie version of Madeline McCann case. Very, I get lovely voices, well presented. And one of the things um, I was told that was very likable about this particular podcast was they put all of their sources that they got their information from. And this particular person who loves a show was very impressed by that. And I agree, that's a very good thing to do. Um, that's even better than what I do. So I went and looked at all the sources because I noted during the show that I didn't agree with an awful lot that was being presented. 
nicely presented, but I didn't agree with it. And I went to all the sources and I found almost, they were tabloids, one tabloid after the other tabloid after the other tabloid. And anybody who knows the tabloids that talked about this case know that they're not telling the truth a good portion of the time. What did I, what did I not see? What did I not see in their, in their, um, in their sources? And I will show you exactly what I did not see in their sources. Let me find it. Where did I put it? Okay, right here. Oh, sorry, this one. I did not see. Over on the left side of your screen, you see Gonzalo Amaral. He wrote, he was a detective on the Madeleine McCann case. He wrote the book, Truth of the Lie. And of course there it's in Portuguese, so you can't read that, but there is a translation of it. So there's no reason why you cannot access uh, his book, The Truth of the Lie, the detective on the case. On the other side of the screen, you will see my book, Profile of the Disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Uh, I wrote that book and you can get it on Smashwords, not Amazon because Amazon has blocked the book because the McCann's threatened them with a libel suit. Uh, but this book is available on Barnes, at Barnes and Noble, Smashwords, Kobo, and all those other places. We, I would say Gonzalo Amaral is the expert on the case. No question. He's the detective. They should have read his book before they did the show. I am the second expert on this case. I am the criminal profiler who spent years on this case. I should be, they should read my book and then present the show. However, that's not what happened. They presented the show based on tabloids. Uh, so what you're getting is a story, but not necessarily a proper analysis. And I just want you to understand that, I, you know, I, the Crime Junkie does a lot of cool things. And I'm sure what they do is they, they, they find all the information they can in the papers and stuff, and they present the show. They don't necessarily spend weeks on end studying every, like the, if they're doing the Madeleine McCann case, they're not necessarily going back to the police files and studying that for the next month before they do the show. They're presenting a story. So I just want you to understand that when you go to one of these channels, you're getting a story about the case, very well presented, very enjoyable. It isn't necessarily something highly analytical and just know that. Um, that's. But I don't have an objection just because everybody wants to know a little bit about something. So since they're not upset, getting people obsessed with the case where they're going into it, you know, into massive amounts of, uh, you know, just episode after episode after episode where they're bringing people in and feeding them information that isn't necessarily valid and then telling them, yes, this could be true and this could be true. And then everybody gets obsessed and all hell breaks loose. So that's, that's where I come down on that. So now what happened in this case was, first of all, there was the basic case. And let me see if I can just give you the, I'm going to get, re reiterate the basic case. And then I'll go into the next problem which is where I disagree with the people doing the actual, huh, the ones who got a whole lot of publicity doing things like podcasts and television shows and writing books. And they presented tremendous amounts of misinformation and put people down all those rabbit, you know, those rabbit holes. It's it just, it's just really, really bad. And, and they're not going to be happy. I'm going to say what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it. So anyway, let's take just a basic look at this case. So the girl leaves Amherst. Now, just to give you a little bit about her background, um, and this is an area where people go crazy about. She went to West Point for a year, uh, studying, you know, really hard stuff. And uh, she, and the, after the freshman year, she apparently stole some stuff from a commissary and they make a big deal of it and say it was Fort Knox. Okay, it wasn't, she didn't steal gold from Fort Knox. She stole from a commissary, uh, shoplifted, and she got tossed out of the school. And obviously there's this bad behavior. And the question is, why does she have bad behavior? Two possibilities. One is she has a personality disorder and she likes to get away with stuff and thought she could, or she just her, she couldn't take the pressure anymore at West Point. So she decided to do something that would basically end her, end her career there. She just, you know, she, in other words, couldn't walk away herself, but thought if somebody else threw her out, then she wouldn't have to make the decision. So she did something naughty and they chucked her out. Um, and that may be what happened. So anyway, she left there and she went to Amherst and studied nursing. Well, about three months before all this went down, apparently she started using credit cards that weren't hers to order food in restaurants and pizzas. And again, why is she doing that? You know, what's sending her over that edge? Uh, does she, can, can she not handle pressure? Is that what gets to her? Uh, and we do not know. And 
So we can all stop being psychologists because from the outside, we don't know what her issue was, whether she had a personality disorder or whether she was just depressed and just didn't want to, couldn't handle anything anymore and wanted to run away. I don't know. But right before she went on this trip north uh, to New Hampshire, she also crashed her father's car. Uh, he had come down to help her buy a new car and they had gone out looking and then she dropped him at his hotel, motel, and went to a party, got apparently plastered and 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 and, and almost totaled his car, $10,000 worth of damage on a fairly new car or a brand new car. But anyway, he was not happy, but it wasn't hopeless. There was a way to at least get the insurance to cover it. And she had to pick up some insurance papers. So at any rate, following that, she lets the people know at school that she's going away because of this death in the family. Um, but clearly to me, if she told people there was a death in the family, it mean, meant she was planning to come back. She wanted an excuse for going away for a few days and coming back. Uh, she wasn't running away permanently because if she was, she wouldn't give a crap what they thought she was, you know, if she didn't show up for class. So she goes off in her car. She drives north. And so she's going, she's taking this route. Um, on the left, you see her route. She's going straight up north. Uh, and some people think she was fleeing to Canada. And I'll discuss that in a minute. But since she gave the information to you know, the school that she was, you know, had a, had a reason for not being there. It doesn't seem like she was fleeing the country, uh, more like she was just getting away. And she goes, she goes up here to a place called Haver, wait a minute, what is it? Haverhill, Haverhill. And then she goes off the highway and then she crashes. Um, and when she crashes, now this is a little town she pulled off in Haverhill. It's this cute little place, you know, a little sweet town in New Hampshire, very pretty, but you know, it's, it's, it's nighttime. And it's snowy and it's cold. So it's February, you know. So um, she might have been going, you know, she had done some searches, uh, places to stay at. Maybe she was going to go hiking in the snow. Maybe she was going to, you know, just have a good time out there. She had been out in New Hampshire a lot with her father. So it wasn't unusual. So then she goes down, she comes around. Uh, she's coming down the street here and she loses control of the car right about here and then goes and then she crashes. And after she crashes over here, you'll see a school bus pulled up and the school bus driver asked her, he said, are you, are you OK? And she said, yes, shook up, but OK. He says, well, I'll call the police for you. And she said, oh, no, 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 I've already called like AAA. And he knew that was a lie because they had no cell service in the area. So it, it was like, what the heck? So he went home and what did he do? He called the police. So the police then. Uh, this is this is the crash site, by the way, over here. You see where she crashed? There's houses around in this area, uh, but it was dark outside. And anyway, over here, you see he made the call to 911. The dispatch went out and then the police arrived. OK, so now the police have arrived. And when the police arrive, she's not there. She's just gone. So now this is where all the problem starts with the conspiracies and the theories and all the stuff that went on after that remember uh, this this case happened when was it 2004 and this was five days after facebook started so this became a facebook thing and then it then it went into podcasts and then it went to movies and everybody had to get on board about what happened to her and a lot of analysis was done about things that had no bearing at all so uh, and that that bothers the heck out of me because I think it's stupid. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> so let's start with uh, James Renner. Uh, James Renner wrote a book called True Crime Addict. Now, before he did that, by the way, these these guys, uh, I think they were first because it gets really confusing. They're they're podcasters. Uh, they are. And I'm going to say the name wrong because I don't remember what it was when I heard it. Lance Reinsterna. Or something like that. And Tim Pilari, um, they did a podcast in 2015. So, you know, 10 years had passed and all kinds of stuff had been on the internet, but now this podcast came out. It's called Missing, Missing Maura Murray. Huge podcast, show after show after show after show after show. Exactly what I say, I don't like. Now, I'm not saying they have bad hearts. I'm just simply saying that there's not that information you needed to waste your time with. But why were you doing... 20, 30 shows on this, except to keep the thrill going, to keep people addicted, to get them involved and to get them to 
start seeing things that aren't there and having them theorize and reach out. And I don't agree with that. I think it's unethical. Um, all I just want to say, this guy's got great eyes. The guy has the most beautiful blue eyes I have ever seen. Handsome dude. Anyway, that was just an aside. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, he does that. Then, then we, and they have, I'll get to some of their weird stuff that they were involved with later. Um, now we have, after that, we have, in 2016, James Renner wrote this book called True Crime Addict. Okay, hold it. I have to put on a fan. And if you, you can hear this fan, let me know because I'm sweating so hard now in this 85 degree house. I don't want to interfere with the show. So everybody tell me if you can hear the fan because if you can, I'm leaving that sucker on. So let me let me go up here to your comments. Can you Can you hear the fan? Or is it not too horrible? Yeah, he is good looking. <laughs> he is good looking. He, he is really good looking. <laughs> so. But sorry, those, those little blue eyes were just beautiful. Um, oh, that's not necessarily true. They were putting up basics in different videos. Not, a, not at all. And I'm going to explain this in a minute because you don't need 30 videos to keep putting out the same thing. What you're doing is putting out little teeny details of things that do not matter. And this is my point. They do not matter. Fan is okay. Oh, thank you, Julia. She says, fan is okay. No fan problem. Oh, good, because... I'm like really sweating. Okay, so let, let me move on. And I'll explain about this issue of all these details in these podcasts. Okay, it's my opinion. Okay, folks, so you don't have to have the same opinion. You can enjoy podcasts. You can listen to all 30, 30 rounds of it and, and not have an issue with it. I'm going to tell you as a professional, I have an issue with it. Now, I'm going to explain why you can agree or disagree, but I'm going to explain why. So anyway, James Renner wrote this book, True Crime Addict. And I find it rather amusing because after I put this up as my promo, uh, uh, you know, that, that was going to talk about this. Um, <laughs> what? Can't hear the fan, by the way. Okay. Somebody else said they can't hear the fan. Yes. Okay. So James Renner, after I put this, this up in my promo, immediately contacted me. He followed me on Twitter and he sent me an email, very lovely email that said he was a fan of my work which quite frankly, I don't believe he even knew what my work was. Sorry, James, I have issues with whether I believe you or not. And I'm going to explain why. Okay, so <laughs> he wrote a book. And in this book, the issue is how I lost myself in the mysterious disappearance of Maura Murray. Now, he'd already written another book, how he went, like, when he was a kid, he fell in love with this missing girl, and he was obsessed with her. And it's kind of creepy. I'm sorry, James, it's kind of creepy. And then he says he, after that book, he wrote about this little 10 year old girl who went missing. And he became so obsessed that even when he went into a, like a, like a, a, a grocery store and he was at the counter, he'd think the man behind the counter is keeping kids in his basement. And it gave him post-traumatic stress syndrome. And so he had to go to a therapist. And I'm like, really? Okay, all right, dude. And then he says the therapist told him he was a psychopath. <laughs> and, and then he goes, oh, that, that's not nice to hear. She goes, oh, it's okay though, because you're also very intelligent. So you can take your sociopathy and move it to a different level. Um, and therefore you're not going to be Ted Bundy, but you know, you'll put it to some use. And I'm like, okay, I'm a little concerned that that's the way you start a book. And I'm really concerned that any publisher would then publish your book. Sorry, James, but if I was a publisher and you told me in your book that they had diagnosed you as a psychopath and you didn't even have an issue with it. I don't want to publish your book. And why is that? Uh, because psychopaths are pathological liars. They're manipulators. So I don't trust you. Now, uh, I'm hoping that, James, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm glad if you're not killing off people and you found a, you are a good journalist. I'll, I'll give you that in a way. You're, you're, you're a good writer. I don't know if you're a good journalist. You're a good writer. Um, and you can keep people's attention. So I, I appreciate good writing. But some of the stuff you do go into in this book are, is obsessive. And you pull out facts that aren't facts. And you went after the family and said things about them and the boyfriend of this girl. And you went off on these tangents, which were unprovable, but did a lot of damage to their reputations and did nothing to find her. And that's my point. So I have an issue with that. So uh, I hope, James, that we can agree to disagree and you don't send, you know, start stalking me and send people after me like the last person I disagree with. <laughs> So, you know, sorry, James, you put you, that you were a psychopath in the book and I'm a criminal profiler and I'm not going to disagree with what they say. Okay. So 
True Crime Addict came out and had it, it sold very, very well. Uh, James did a, I say he's a, James, you're a good writer. Uh, but I, the stuff you put into the book was concerning. And here's one of the things, it's called exaggeration. And it's called a, a being obsessed and exaggerating about what you're obsessed about. So for example, there's a whole lot about why she left town. Now the girl is, oh, how old was she? Hold on a second. She was 21 years old. Okay. 21 years old. Yeah. 21. 21 year olds are not known to always make the brilliant, most brilliant decisions. She'd obviously made a whole bunch of bad decisions and probably was depressed, maybe freaked out. Um, we don't know what the state of her, affair, her relationship with her boyfriend was. There's a whole bunch of, bunch of stuff about the boyfriend, but he wasn't in the area. So that's meaningless. Um, she, so the question is, was she running away to Canada, which he thinks is the number one possibility? And, or did she just want to get away for the weekend, which is much more likely? Or did she want to kill herself? Because there was this issue about in her car, um, in her car, there was this, is this it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, see, empty box of simply sleep. So she could have take, had some uh, something to knock her out. And there, it, she wouldn't be the first person to walk off into a snow snowy location to go off into the trees, into the forest, like a mile or two, sit down on a rock, have some alcohol, take a whole bunch of sleeping pills, get hypothermia and die. Wouldn't be the first person. Not impossible. But there is no proof when she left town that she was going to do that because she did let people know she, you know, she was missing the class for a reason. So there was no actual proof of suicide. Now, she left town um, and was on her own. So there's this whole bunch of stuff he puts in his book, too, that somebody was that the person was there was a tandem situation where she was driving one car. Somebody else was behind her in another car. No proof of that. She went to the bank and withdrew money from the ATM. She would do that alone. Uh, she went to a, a liquor store and she was alone. And then he tried to claim that somebody up in New Hampshire saw her in a liquor store with some friends. And this apparently is the actual stuff about the liquor store and she was never in there. So this is nonsensical stuff that's put out there to try to create a theory, to try to create a scenario that you feel like running away with. Now, Let's talk about why people do what they do, especially when they're 21. And I'm going to use an example from my life. And this is where Denmark comes in. So I was 22. I was going to American University. And the winter semester came along and I was bored. I, I just, you know, the first semester was okay and I did all right, but I was kind of bored and I kind of wanted something exciting. So I had these choices. I could go to England or I could go to Denmark and do a semester. Uh, I should have picked a uh, UK because uh, even though it rains a lot, I probably would have been happier there, but I picked Denmark. And the reason I picked Denmark was because <laughs> now this is shows you how stupid you are when you're 22. So I had read Hans Brinker and the silver skates when I was a child. Now, okay. So it happened in Holland and not Denmark, but they had canals and they skated down canals and oh, how beautiful and romantic. So I saw Copenhagen and Copenhagen had a canal and, you know, you can skate on it and it's so cool and romantic. And, you know, the funny thing is I don't like cold weather and I don't like the dark and I, and I don't, I don't like to skate, <laughs> even though my mother was an ice capades skater. Um, I grew up hating skating. So <laughs> what was wrong with me? I mean, what delusion did I have that I should run off to Denmark in the winter? Now, maybe if I'd gone in June and stay through the wonderful summer where I'd be warm and there was light, you know, like into the late night hours, I'd be happy. But there was only sunlight between like 10 and two. And I think I went to school at nine in the morning, got out at three. And since I couldn't afford most of the food in Denmark at the time, I, I ate in the cafeteria in the basement. And I never saw sunlight for like five days straight. It sucked. And I was very, very depressed. Well, so I somehow got through and I'm not, this is not a slur on Denmark. I'm just saying I shouldn't have gone there in the winter and I was an idiot. Uh, so it got to closer to spring. And so I went to this place and let me show you where I went to. I went to this place called, um, it was called Land of Legends. I don't know what it's called in, 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 in Danish, um, but we were taken there. I was part of an anthropology group. So we went to this land of legends and 
It was, I had, we had, we had took a, a train from where, from Copenhagen. I lived in Albertschland, which was still west of Copenhagen. And it kept going to this place called, where the red dot is here, um, Ledru. Ledru, Ledru, I can't pronounce Danish. It's usually, I, I can't do it right. But anyway, where the red dot is. And then you see that little blue line, it goes out to Land of Legends. Well, Land of Legends looks like this. It's a reconstructed, like, Iron Age, Viking kind of place. And you can, you, they brought out students to do things like this, sit in these huts and pretend they were living in those days. So, so, so this, is, this is what I was dealing with at the time. So now I went out to this place, okay? And when I was there, it, was, it, start, it started to be night and they handed me this thing of cream, okay? It was like a, a bowl of cream and a forked stick like this. And they told me I'm, I'm supposed to beat this thing until I get butter. And I was beating the sucker and I was beating it and I was beating it. And a freaking hour later, I had cream. I mean, I was so pissed. I mean, I was really super, super depressed because I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know what my issue was because I, I was 22. I don't remember that far back. But for whatever freaky reasons, I said, screw this. Put down my damn bowl. And I walked, I walked from the land of legends all the way back to the train station. And it's interesting because I'm trying to remember this time. And, and you're looking at this map, which I did, I, I remembered it being a really long walk in the dark with the moon overhead. And it was kind of creepy and scary. It, it wasn't a suburb. It was empty country. And there were these, um, there were these bushes and that was about it. And every time a car came down the road, I hid behind the bushes because I didn't want to be seen on the road because I didn't want to be killed by a serial killer. Uh, I some, somehow had enough sense to hide when cars went by. And then I'd come out and I'd walk a little more. And the next time I saw lights, I'd hide behind another bush. I did this all the way back to the train station. And I looked at this map recently. I'm like, oh my God, it was 44 minutes. It was a damn long walk. What the hell was I thinking to walk this distance in the night by myself what kind of idiot was I anyway? Well, <laughs> obviously an idiot. Um, and now let's assume that I had been killed along the way. Let's assume I had been murdered or picked up. I finally got tired of walking and somebody said, I'll give you a ride. And I jumped in the car and took a ride and never was seen again. Do you know, then we have James Renner writing a book about me going, well, you know, I think she was having this kind of problem. And this, this is what happened. And that is what happened. And then we'll go on all the, just uh, the, you know, all these uh, podcasts would start about me, how I, the American girl disappeared in Denmark. And it's because she had, and they go through my whole history and really all come down to was the damn butter. And I was in a bad mood. I mean, there, I don't, I didn't have a boyfriend there. I wasn't breaking up with anybody. I wasn't pissed at anybody. I think I was just bored and kind of a, a, an idiot. And I just decided I don't feel like staying for two more days. And I just said, screw it and went back. Um, so I just want to let you know that if you do want to make butter, you do not have to use a a, uh, a bowl and a, and a fork stick. You can use this. <laughs> this, is, this is my promo for the day. This is a butter maker. You buy it on Amazon. You put your cream in there that you get from the health food store unpasteurized and you shake it for four minutes. And I'll tell you, it makes the best butter you've ever had. <laughs> this is actually true. I bought this for my granddaughter and I'm like, this couldn't possibly work in four minutes. It worked in four minutes. So I keep thinking if I had had this when I was in Denmark, maybe I would have stayed the rest of the damn night and wouldn't have walked down a lonely country road, but no, I had a fork. I mean, a fork stick. <laughs> so if you want to make butter, go to Amazon. There's a link below, supports the channel. Okay, so that's that. And the reason I bring this up is lots of people have spent an immense amount of hours going on about why Maura Murray went off. I don't know why she went off. Maybe because she just was in a shitty mood. You know, damn it, everything's gone wrong. I just crashed my dad's car. I just can't take the pressure. I just want to get away. So she jumps in her car, grabs some money, gets some liquor, and gets away. But unfortunately... She crashes her damn car. And that's that does suck. That does suck. But that's what she did. She crashed the car. So and then she vanished. And I'll get into the vanishing part. But let's get back to why she had to leave town. So here's what happened. James Renner starts going after the family and starts talking about this guy. Um, the dad, Fred, Fred, uh, sorry, what did I just say? Um, Fred Murray. 
Fred Murray is, is dad. Okay. And uh, where's dad? Where's dad? Oh, here's dad. Okay. Fred Murray is dad. He starts going on about how Fred, Fred Murray may have abused her sexually or otherwise. And so there was this horrible thing going on and maybe it was the boyfriend too. She, and she wasn't running away from her own bad behavior and just the stress. Maybe she was running away from the men in her life. And that's why she was trying to get to Canada. And maybe people were trying to help her get away from the men in her life. Garbage, zero, zero evidence of this. So, so Fred Murray was pissed at, at James Renner for, for saying all this crap about him. And then these guys, the podcast guys got together with James Renner and they started doing some investigating in Canada. And James Renner claims that up in Canada at a music store, some people saw her and, and it just, you know, years ago, they thought they saw a girl that looked like her. This is not evidence. This is conjecture and a bunch of crap that you can't prove. So don't even go there. But these guys were now starting to hook up with James Renner. So move along. Now you've got this problem. You have got now what I pointed out here, the oxygen channel, the over here, the disappearance of Maura Murray. Oxygen comes out a year after uh, 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 um, Renner's book, um, uh, and gets all of these guys together, and especially the podcaster dudes, and decides to do a six-part series on the disappearance of Maura Murray. So now they start, and they're back at, what happened? Why did she leave town? Why would she do such a thing? Why would she leave town? And it, it, it is, it, in my opinion, this stuff is, gets disgusting, because here's what happens. I've worked enough television shows, which I don't do anymore, because they will call people up and say, we need to talk to you. And if you watch this show, which you shouldn't, um, you will see on, uh, here's the, the woman who was the, uh, the woman who run, uh, is the big, the host of the show. Her name is Maggie Freelong. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Anyway, let me show you a picture of her. She is a, a journalist. Um, she's done a whole bunch of stuff. And then she got chosen to do the show. And this, this, is, this is Maggie. She's a reporter and a producer, and she's into mental illness, criminal justice, social issues, whatever, whatever. And then she does this documentary. So what you do as the host of the show is that you get together a team of some sort. So she gathered, she gathered together a team and she put together the, the two podcasters dudes. They were part of the team. And then she went to, um, she also got this guy. And I really feel kind of sorry for this guy. Cause I'm not sure what happened to him, but, um, his name is, um, He's a retired U.S. Marshal named Art Broderick. He comes along for the ride. Like he literally is just riding along. She, they talk in the car. What do you think happened? When she was on her way to New Hampshire, there's an hour that we can't account for. Like we got there sooner and she took an hour longer. What do you think could have happened? And then they, it's stupid. I mean, I don't know. You don't know. Don't waste your time with it. It's years later. You can't prove anything. Maybe she pulled off the side of the road and sat there drinking. Maybe she went someplace and had a bite to eat. I don't know. Neither do you. And why are you wasting so much time trying to figure it out? So anyway, Art, I, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what to say about him. He offered pretty much nothing of worth in, in six entire shows. He said, yeah, that could, oh, we should, we could check that out. He said nothing that was analysis oriented. And I don't know whether they just literally cut, you know, like edited the shit out of this guy and everything he said never made it because it was supposed to all be about her. I don't know because I've been edited and look like a moron when the show came out. Maybe they screwed him over, but he offered like nothing in the show. And she kept saying, now I need to find out. Now the next step is I have to find out this and I have to find out that. And I'm thinking, you don't have to find out anything because quite frankly, there's nothing to find out, but she's going to find something out. So here's the kind of stuff they do. And I want you to understand this before you watch these shows. It's just disgusting. So anyway, one of the things she did was she was hounding the living hell out of the sister. Um, this is one of the sisters. And this is a sister supposedly that day before or the, right before she left, uh, she'd had a conversation with, there was she had been on the phone and then at the school and then somebody saw her and they said she was in a catatonic state state. This is Mora. She's sitting by the phone in a catatonic state, catatonic. And they asked her, what's wrong? And she said, my sister. And that's all she said. Well, apparently she got out of rehab and started drinking. Okay. Now, you know, I'd be concerned if my sister, you know, went to rehab and came out and had failed. 
but catatonic state that had destroyed her entire world. You know, you're making crap up. So anyway, they bring this woman in. They harass her and harass her and harass her to come and talk to them. And this is what happens. If you don't come and talk to them, they will say you're hiding something. You can't, you can't win because now we're talking about oxygen channel. It's going to be a big show and you won't talk to them. And they will whine about that and say, I wonder why they won't talk. I wonder what it is they're trying to keep from us. Maybe they just don't want to talk to you. You can't, you know, you're, you're out here just trying to make money. You're, you're not a detective. You're nobody. They don't have to talk to you. Nobody has to talk to Pat Brown either, unless I'm really working a case. But you don't have to talk to me just because I say I want you to. Oh, I want to talk to you on my channel. You do not have to talk to me. Now, many families do because they just they want to they want to get their loved one's name out there. and They think it's going to help. And for all the social media and media, more Mur Murray case got. She's still missing. It doesn't usually do a damn thing. So, but, you know, this is the kind of stuff they push in these shows. And I find it rep reprehensible. So anyway, they brought this woman in. Now she's sitting in this little crappy motel because you can tell it's a shitty little motel and she's sitting on a shitty little bed and they set up a studio. Now, I don't know what they told her, but this is what really upset me. So they got her sitting here and they're, they're doing this interview and look at what's happening in the next room. And this just, I find appalling. So next, in the next room, we have art and this body language lady, supposedly. And they're watching on secret cameras, essentially, <laughs> what this woman's body movements are. And they're talking on the show. I think she's exhibiting this. And I think she's exhibiting that. I mean, if they didn't tell her they were they were going to analyze her through these cameras and they were going to humiliate her in this way, she ought to sue the shit out of them. But, you know, this is the kind of things they do. And it's appalling. Um, there was no reason to do this at all. If she came in to just do an interview, they should have been respectful. But doing this kind of creepy shit behind the scenes, this is sickening. And what did they come up with? Pretty much nothing because there was nothing to come up with. That's not she left town, not because there was some big, huge, weird thing going on. Nobody was responsible except Moro felt like getting out of town and they just blew it all up. Now, take a look at this. This is the kind of other bullshit stuff they do. So here, <laughs> here's this cabin and they've got this, all the pictures up because this ha you have to have visuals when you do media. So, so now um, what's her face? Um, Maggie has to, she touches things and goes, now we need to do this and we need to do that. Now get, get a load of what she has to do. So she's trying to figure out what happened to uh, what happened to Mora? So now she does. Now, after they've gone through all the family history, they've come up with nothing as to why she left. So that was a big waste of time. Then they come up with nothing about the hour she's missing on the way to New Hampshire. So that was a waste of time. So now they're in New Hampshire. And here's the piece of information in New Hampshire that is is supposed to be something that has some point. And it does have a point, And I'll show you what it is. OK, so. After she gets out of the car and uh, the police are coming and she's no longer there, you can see over here, this is where the crash was. And this is where a dog, not a cadaver dog, but a, a dog just looking, you know, scent dog, lost her scent right here. And it looked like she walked away from the vehicle. She walked away and then she vanished, which means to most people, including the police, that she got in a vehicle. Now, what vehicle did she get into? Now, here again, we have we have James Renner <laughs> saying the most ridiculous things about this, that there's there they went. There was this uh, tandem car that two other people or girlfriends or somebody followed her all the way two and a half hours to New Hampshire, pulled off this row with her. And when she crashed, she jumped in their car. First of all, those no other car was seen doing that. But also, you know, if you're going to go to Canada together, why don't you just go to, Can I mean, if you're just going to go to New Hampshire together, you, you all ride in the same damn car. You don't need to take two. And she's traveling all by herself. That's ridiculous. And if she's going to Canada, what's the point of the tandem anyway? She just drives north to Canada. I mean, it makes no sense. But that was his claim. The other real possibility is that she's walking down the road and she's trying to get away from the police. And you ask, why is she doing that? Well, she was drinking. And if she was with the car when the police got there, she'd get a DUI for sure. And she'd be in more trouble than ever. So I think she just walked away, hoping that they wouldn't see her. And then if somebody came along and said, do you need a ride? And yeah, it's nighttime. It's cold and it's snowy. Yeah, I do need a ride. She got in the car with somebody, not somebody she knew. So all that nonsense about she knew the person's ridiculous. She got in the car to take a ride. 
from there on, one of two things could have happened. One, he was a serial killer and she just was taken someplace and murdered and that's the end of her. Or he could have taken her someplace, anybody could have, and dropped her where she said, just drop me here. And then maybe she was super depressed and she wandered off into, into the, the landscape and died someplace and nobody's found her body. And if you were that guy who gave her the ride, the last thing you're going to do is tell the police, I gave her a ride because you know your life is going to be ruined. <laughs> They're going to assume you're a serial killer and you're going to completely destroy your life. So if you gave her a ride and she walked away from your car, you're not going to talk. If you were a serial killer, you're not going to talk. So she's either dead out there somewhere because of a serial killer or she's dead out there because she walked away and got hypothermia and died. Either way, she's probably not alive. More likely, serial killer but not alive, not in Canada, none of that stuff's happening. So now we have her, so we have all these silly things happening. Then it gets worse. So now, now the oxygen channel, they're searching for. Now they know she went there and she disappeared. So now they're trying to figure out how she disappeared. And here we get more stupidity upon stupidity. Oh, let me, do, oh, the police uh, thing. Oh, let me, let me point that out. They went to talk to the police because here was another whole social media crap that came out that was just gotten to the point of ridiculousness, that the police were involved in, in, in doing something to her. In other words, she didn't disappear in any other way, but by the police, a police officer taking her and he, the police officer was the one that did something to her. So they, they, they did talk to the, the police officer, this guy uh, who was the one who arrived at the scene and they eventually didn't find anything suspicious about him. They also talked to the assistant attorney general and they said he was very cagey and he was like, you know, I can't discuss that. And I can't discuss that. You know, I like he can discuss an open case with them because they're the they're doing a stupid documentary. No, he doesn't have any reason to have to listen to these people or talk to them. He's doing what a attorney general is going to do um, and what he should do. So, you know, you know, go away, people. So anyway. They came up with in the, in the show that, oh, no, it, it, we don't really come up with anything that says that it was uh, that the police were involved. So now they got to figure out where where could she be? So now here here are the two stupidest things I've ever seen. And this is why I say these things just go off the rails and it's embarrassing. So anyway, remember that I remember our two cute guys, especially the one with the blue eyes. OK, so supposedly in this show. They get some coordinates. Somebody sends some coordinates through their podcast and says, this is where her body is. Now, there's no reason in God's earth why they need to go check this out. But they th say, well, you know, it could be they're setting us up. And when we get up there, we're going to get attacked or something. They're going to kill us. Or maybe her body really is up there. I don't know which one it is. So, of course, it's television. So what do they do? They climb a freaking mountain. So they go, they go up to this mountain in the middle of absolutely nowhere not near the, the site where the girl went missing, but quite a quite a distance away. And yes, there they are. Look at them. There they go. They got somebody, they got a, they got a, um, a guy who does hiking, you know, stuff. And they tell him that, you know, it might be dangerous. We might get killed. But, you know, so anyway, they go up the mountain for like, Jesus, the whole damn day. It's like eight hours worth of trekking. It's like a hell of a long way to get to this place where these coordinates are, you know. Now they get to the location. It's just so stupid. And here they are, scrubbling through the bushes. Do you think you see anything? Huh? Is there clothing here? Do you see a body, a skeleton? Guess what? Nothing. Okay. Well, I guess that was fake. Yeah, no kidding. What the hell are you even doing up there? Because this is this is not this is not intelligent. This is not good journalism. This is garbage. Okay, so then it gets worse. You think it can't get worse? It can get worse. So now They've got no answers, right? They've come up in five damn shows. They've got nothing new to offer at all. <laughs> because guess what? There was never anything new in the last 20 years. The girl took a ride and went missing. That's the end of it. There's no big, huge secret behind her. There's no secret there. It's just she got in a car and disappeared. Like many a girl has disappeared with a serial killer. Sad for the family, but... All this crap that's been said for the last 20 years and all the insane podcasts and blogs and all this stuff, nitpicking and everything is garbage and obsessing people over something, telling them they can help solve this case. Nobody has solved this case. James Renner didn't solve this case. And this woman, uh, Ma Maggie, the journalist, she didn't solve the case. And the podcasters didn't solve the case. But all of them made a hell of a lot of money. Um, so anyway, the last show. Guess what they do? This gets so retarded. Now they bring in 
Alison Dubois, the medium. And if anybody wastes their time watching somebody like this, she's got shows. She's been brought on all the top shows. She's, she's made millions, I think, off of her supposed psychic powers. Now, I don't know how many of you have watched The Mentalist. Uh, I'm going to do a little show on that. Uh, but The Mentalist, uh, where, where Patrick says, when they keep saying, oh, you're a psychic, he goes, no, I'm not. Because <laughs> there is no such thing as a psychic. They're all con people. I was a con artist. I'm going to say it straight up from you can sue me. She's a con artist because that's what psychics are. There's nothing that they can glean that they haven't just been very clever at gathering as much information as they can by any methodology that you could use by um, psychology or, or profiling. You know, some of them can profile quite well. But, uh, you know, I'm a profiler. I don't claim I'm a psychic if I come up with something. I'm like, I, I know that Maura Murray was taken by a serial killer. No, I, I'm not psychic. I wouldn't say that. I'd say most likely because she was desperate to get off that street. She got in a vehicle. That's what the dogs show. And she never was seen again. High chance that she got nailed by a serial killer. That's profiling. That's not psychic work. So anyway, this woman comes in. Oh my God, the stupidest things I've ever seen. So anyway, they bring her in and they claim they didn't tell her anything about this case, right? Now, mind you, they're flying her into New Hampshire. <laughs> How many huge cases in New Hampshire would Oxygen be talking about? That's if they didn't tip her off anyway. Well, what would they be talking about? Oh, maybe it's Maura Murray. I mean, uh, so she probably read James Renner's book before she came because oddly enough, an awful lot of what she says comes straight out of James, James Renner's kind of concepts. And then they get on the show and they, they do this they go and they put this picture down. Now she says, oh, this is the girl. It's Maura Murray. So now let's assume there were three or four different cases. It could be. Well, she can just study up on the three or four cases. And when she gets there and finds out it's Maura Murray, she's ready because she's already investigated those cases. She comes up. She says a lot of things that they're like, oh, how did you know that? How did you know that? Because she read the damn book and she watched the podcast, you idiots. That's how she knows this. It's all bull, you know. So, so anyway, they take. Then she finally comes to the conclusion. Get this: her her conclusion after all of this is that she's under a bridge. So here are the bridges. So, <laughs> so she's under one of these bridges. So they go. They find out where the bridges are, and then they go to the sites. And she goes, "No, I don't feel her at this bridge." And then, no, I don't feel her at this bridge. And then, no, I don't feel her at this bridge. Guess what? They didn't find her under any bridges. And that was the end of the show. So there. <laughs> so what did six episodes of this crap actually do? Absolutely nothing. It harassed the family. It harassed people who didn't probably want to speak. Uh, you know, it, it did not serve the purpose of, of furthering the case in any way, shape, or form. And this is the whole point. There's no reason for this obsessive long-term examination of cases when you have no expertise and you are not offering anything of any worth. So the one-time show, we're just explaining what happened. I'm okay with that. I'm not going to go against that. But when you do 30 podcasts, you're just stretching stuff. And you know what, what did he get? How many? He's got like 10 million downloads, the, the, the two podcaster dudes. And they have not solved the case and neither have what one of their listeners has solved the case or offered anything of use. So this is all, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, cold, cold case masturbation. I mean, is that what it is? It's just, it makes us all excited and we get all into it and it, it, it gives us a cheap ass thrill. I mean, this is sad because it's abusing all the people. It's abusing the police. It's abusing the family. It's abusing you know, the, the neighborhoods. And, and because you're not offering anything, you're just you know, digging a bunch of rabbit holes for people to go down and, and take advantage of. And that's why I have an issue. So if you want to just hear about a case, I'm going to be as generous as I can being an expert. And these people are not experts, but at least at least they tell a nice story and they're not forcing you to look at all kinds of evidence that isn't actually evidence. So I, I just have a real extreme issue with that. So I'm not happy with what has happened with um, uh, what's gone on uh, with this with this case. It's been 20 years of, I think, abuse of the family and abuse of 
cold case issues. So there's, that's my speech for tonight. Uh, <laughs> and now I'll go to answering questions. All right. Uh, so Slim Dog tries to say, why are you doing the stream? If you can't figure that out, Slim Dog, you probably need to leave the cat broadcast. Because what did I do? I'm not telling people to go down rabbit holes. I'm not trying to draw this out into 30 different podcasts. I'm trying to explain what is most likely to have happened in a very quick moment and tell you why we shouldn't be doing this kind of uh, excessive social media stuff. So if you don't like it, take a hike. So I'm good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm good with uh, people not agreeing with me and going away. Um, but I, I will answer a few of the simple questions. What are the odds? Well, let me put tell you what the odds are. The odds are it happens. It happens. It, all you need is one guy and one moment. People ask this question all the time about serial killers. You know, you can have a girl that comes out of a store. What are the odds that when she came out of the store, a serial killer got her? Well, she disappeared and ended up raped and murdered in the bushes. The answer was obviously a pretty good at that moment. Now, a serial killer is not grabbing somebody every moment. It might be a year before he grabs another person. He might be cruising over and over and over again and never getting anybody. But that night that he was coming down that road and Maura Murray was standing in it looking for a ride, he's like, dang, Eureka, I got a chance here. And she gets in his car and that's that. So that's just the way it goes. I um, mean, it does happen that way. Um, you know, and she's gone. That's the point. She's, she either was gone because she ran, got into a, a serial killer's car. Or she was gone because she got out of somebody's car and, and, and died someplace. Um, there is no evidence she ever left the country. There is no evidence that anybody followed her and had this stupid tandem idea. Um, none of these things have any support. That's the problem. The only evidence we have, which is why I point out you can't do 30 broadcasts on it. The only evidence is she left home. She arrived in that little town. She crashed her car. Somebody called for the police. When the police got there, she was gone. That's it. Five minutes. I don't even know if I can do five minutes. That was one minute. Other than that, the only thing I've been do doing is explaining why things are nonsensical that people go on and on and on about. Because this is my problem with a lot of uh, what I see in true crime these days. And I understand that it does get, it does, it is enticing. And I have people who follow me who do kind of like these podcasts. I'm not saying you're bad people for following these podcasts. I'm saying they're drawing you in and they are, the stuff they're telling you has no necessary, any kind of validity. It's not valid. So there you go. That's my, let me look back and see what else you said. Um, what? <laughs> What's this? It's it's odd. A lot of YouTube psychics think Mora was picked up by a random driver and then killed in an A-frame house because they listen to each other. You know, this is the funny thing about psychics. You know, people don't realize this. So what happens is it's a lot like um, when somebody gives you a fortune, tells you a fortune. They say, you're going on a long trip. And you think, really? I'm going on a long trip? And then you don't really go on a long trip for like three years. And then three years later, when you go on the long trip, you go, oh, yeah. The psychic told me that. Or maybe you think a long trip is to the grocery store. And so you just say, well, you know, I did go to that long trip to the grocery store. <laughs> you start you start trying to make it true. Now, I remember when uh, there was a girl who went missing. Uh, I'm going to blank on her name. I'll do a story on her one day. She went missing in Virginia in a farm area. Okay. In Charlottesville, Virginia. Ha fancy houses today, but also a lot of farm areas. Psychics contacted me one after the other after the other. And guess what they said? She's going to be found in a field. She's near a haystack. <laughs> she's near an oak tree. Uh, she's near a fence where there are cows. <laughs> all of these were all connected with farming areas. Do you know where her body was found? It was found in a logging area. There was this really small, it was crazy. Uh, in this one street, there was a tiny little logging area where there were whole bunches of logs that were chopped up in huge heaps. That's where her body was found. Do you know, not one psychic told me her body was found in the logging area? Why not if they're all so damn psychic? So the problem is some psychics will actually drive to the area and they'll look around the area and they'll find something to talk about. Or they will do, you know, these days you can do like, uh, 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 what, what's what's the one that you can look down on the, ah, uh, shoot. It's, it's, it's the one we can look down on the, uh, the landscape. It's, shoot, I forgot the name of it. It's cool. And you can you can see everything. You can actually go to another part of the world and you can look down from the satellite and you can see everything. It's awesome. So 
you can do that and you can say, I see an A-frame house. I'm going to say that. I see this. And if you have a thousand people who think they're psychics wanting to say, oh, yeah, I saw this. Some of them will say the same thing or they'll jump on somebody else's parade. So you cannot believe it just because two or three people said this. So what? It's meaningless. Uh, uh, Anna says, uh, Anna Lisette says, lots of animals die in the woods, elk, moose, deer, bison, bears, and the bones would disappear pretty fast. Otherwise, the forest would be a boneyard. <laughs> it's a good, that's a good point. Um, and, you know, I don't think she's, uh, they say there was no evidence she set out to commit suicide. However, as I pointed out with the, the fork stick, I didn't set out, when I went to that location in Denmark, I set out to get a good grade on my, in my anth anthropology class. <laughs> Um, yes, I did get a bad grade because I just, whatever reasons, just felt like not being there. And I walked away. People change their minds. She could have gotten up there to New Hampshire and after she crashed the damn car again, she crashed her dad's car. Now she's crashed her own car and she was drunk both times. I mean, maybe she just said, screw it. And she didn't know where to go. And she took this ride and he said, just drop me off here. And she said, I'm done. She, I'm just going to walk I'm going to walk into the beautiful landscape. I'm going to go up just some of the mountains. And as she, she was already drunk, walk further and further and further until I just don't come back. And so now her body's way up on the mountain, eaten by a lot of animals. And they, they never find her bones, or maybe they find them in another 10 years. And they go, oh, it wasn't a serial killer. She went up on the mountain. Maybe so. But the thing is, we don't know. That is the police's job to determine whether there's any searches that can be done, whether there was a person who might've picked her up, what they're, whether they would have dropped her off or done something to her. That's the police's job. I can guarantee you, none of us are helping out. You know, there really aren't. We're not helping out by doing social media um, uh, to, try to, to try to do that. Uh, to understand is different. To learn and to understand is different than to think that we're out here being crime solvers. What, what a sense. I have a vision of you taking a trip to Denmark to find butter. <laughs> so I have I had some tasty butter in Denmark. I did, uh, but not from that damn stick. I tell you that I did not. Um, yeah. You know, whoa, really? What? 130 podcast episode. Who did that? Uh, Jesus, God almighty. Whew, that that's a, that's a lot. Um, well, here's, I like this one. Circle jerk is another term. Yeah, you know, uh, it's just that there's so much money to be made in podcasting and in YouTubing to, when you can draw things out. I mean, you know, that that series by Oxygen should have been one hour. I mean, quite frankly, they did not need to spend six hours. on. Oh, my. I spent six hours of my life watching that damn thing. And of course, you know, when you um, when you're when you're the host of the show and a journalist and all this stuff. You know, you're making money doing this. You're driving all over New Hampshire. You're having fun. I mean, you're having a good time. It's, you know, you yourself are involved in this and, and it's great. And then you make money because you're being paid for this. But the person who's watching, it doesn't need six hours of the rot you just gave. You could just have done a one hour show on Maura Murray. It's been 20 years. What happened with the Maura Murray case? That's what I'm doing here. You're not going to see a second one or third one or a fourth one. Or six hours of this shit, you know, as I'm just trying to under, help you understand the issues here. And and it's really a shame because it does tremendous damage to 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 a lot of people uh, because they're being accused of things. The more uh, Murray family has suffered a lot from the accusations and 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 depicting them in public to have all these issues. I mean, you know. It's hard enough that you've lost a loved one, but then you have to be put out there as a, you're a failure, you you drink too much, and you oh, I think you sexually assaulted your daughter. That's that's a lot of sick stuff. And it has no business out there because it has nothing to do with anything. It doesn't. Um, it's meaningless, you know, unless it really means something. And if it means something, that's what the police should know. That's what the family, they're talking to the family, they're talking to friends. They're trying to make determinations in order to, to move their case forward. But, you know, not so much for for people out in in in, in, in the world, uh, you know, out here. You know? That is, that's no, that's not true. Absolutely not true, Annalisa. Moore would not have been picked up by a serial killer. Why not? How do you know if a guy's a serial killer when he picks you up? Maybe just a creep who demanded sex re was rejected and dumped her in the country. Maybe, but it could have been a serial killer. Serial killers do pop up. I I worked enough cases to know that. They just show up places. And if you're just unlucky and that's the day they're there, 
you're screwed. Um, so yeah, there's no proof it isn't a serial killer and there's no reason why it couldn't be. Uh, but yes, it could be a guy who just gave her a ride, asked for some sex and she said no. And then he tossed her on a side road. Yeah. And she just, and then she froze to death. That's possible. That's possible. But I would think, and no, that's the whole point. No, it was not a bad cop. There's zero evidence of that. It's a, it's a, it's a horrible thing. The police have worked hard on this case. And this is what people are saying that have tried to push these concepts and these conspiracy theories on the internet. It was a bad cop. And therefore, if you can't solve a case, it's a bad cop. No, it, it, there's no evidence it was a bad cop. And they're doing their job. And, and you have no proof of this. So don't put the idea out there. You know, that's what I think. You know, unless you can say there was truly something squirrely that went on, it, it's it's not fair. It's not fair to all the hardworking police officers, detectives who are who've worked. You know how many hours they put out trying to find this girl, you know, desperately trying to find this girl and they didn't find her. You know, um, I, oh, I want to back, move back to the uh, dumped her on the side of the road. It's possible. But, you know, chances are she would have been found on the side of the road, too, that she wouldn't have wandered into the the bushes or something she would have been you know just dumped on the side of the road and made her way eventually into either another car <laughs> and then to a location uh it, you know it's the fact that her body's never been found leads me to believe either she had to purposely walk off of and she didn't do it in the area she was she where her car was it wasn't like she wanted to get away from the police and she just went into the snow because there were no footprints and the dog did go down the road and then it stopped so it seemed she was on the road when she disappeared so yes, there may be 20 miles away if you know some guy dumped her on the road. I guess she could have walked off into the, the snow, snowy hills or was taken into them or maybe she wanted to go into them. But we don't know and we're not going to figure it out here. So we're just not. I mean, the police have the case and they do what they can. Yeah, this is, this is uh, you're saying, do you think it's possible Maura took her own life because she crashed and couldn't face her dad again with a crashed car? That is one of the theories. Now, she didn't do it right there because there's no footprints. But could she have asked for a ride and then just disappeared off? She could have. And maybe she found she just wanted to get further away where nobody would find her and walk off into the mountains and and and, and give up. Possibly. We don't we don't know. We have no absolutely no idea. That's 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 the that's the point. Um, and then I want to point this out. Red Rama says, I always thought she fled the scene because drinking she was drinking and got in the first car that stopped. My, aunt, my guess is yes, she got into the first car that stopped. And people say, oh, she wouldn't have done that. <sighs> of course she would have done that. She was out. She was trying to get away from the car wreck. She was drinking. She didn't want to get caught by the police. She was cold as crap. She had no place to go, no way to get there. Yeah, she's 21 years old. You don't think she'd get in a car under those circumstances, especially since she'd been drinking? Yes, she would. I mean, that's just that's why I tried to do that's why I pointed out this silly scene here, because if this is a true scene about the fork stick and Denmark. And it was stupid of me to do that, you know, just to walk off in the night and to risk my life walking down a lonely country road. But I did it, you know, because I was 22 and a moron, you know, so. <laughs> um, let's see what else I can see here. Uh yeah, I'm not going to get into anything I know is a bunch of us. Uh, I, I will not put up comments that I know is just junk. Um, you know, that because you're a lot of times people are talking about things that happened that they're getting from James Renner or from some other crap on social media. And there's no proof of it. So let's not go there. There's no point in it. Uh, there's no point in blaming anybody else except Maura made a choice. Maura made a choice to drive away by herself and crash a vehicle drinking. And she'd made a choice, most likely to get in a vehicle. Now, at that point, we can blame, if she got killed by a serial killer, we can also blame the serial killer. That we can, can. But we can't go back and blame every one of her girlfriends, her father, her boyfriend, you know, and try to make a huge thing out of it. They aren't perfect people, but Maura wasn't probably a perfect person either. You know, people make choices. Now, we can go back and say, if their life had been better, they might not have made those choices. You know, well, you know, do I go back and blame my, my, my parents? <laughs> you know, my parents were so awful that I had to go run off into the, the night in Denmark. No, my parents were trying to be nice. They sent me to Denmark and paid for it, those poor people. You know, uh, and I'm sure if they knew about that, I never told them. You know, they would have gone, what the heck were you thinking? And what am I going to say? Well, I always felt like you didn't uh, pay enough attention to me. So I thought I'd walk into the night. <laughs> 
you know, we blame people for things. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Carolina and Kat both said Google Earth. Yeah, that's pretty cool, actually. Google Earth is pretty awesome. So um, uh, uh, that's a good question. Are there any cases in the past that have been solved by podcasters or internet sleuths? Okay, I'll tell you this. I can't think of any. I cannot think of any. Um, the closest I can come to is um, uh, the Jinx show where they got, they had, uh, what's his face in the bathroom, you know, saying, I killed them all. Um, and I don't even know that that was a true confession. He might have just been talking crap. Not that he didn't kill them all, but, you know, I, that might have helped get the prosecution going. Um, certainly, when I, when I did the, the show recently on Martha Moxley, uh, there are certainly people's books um, like Mark Furman's that got the prosecution to take uh, Michael Skakel to court and get him convicted in a way that I think he was railroaded. I do not think the evidence supported that. And you can watch my show and see why. So I do think things can promote certain prosecutions. I don't know how many I've ever seen solve a case. So I'll tell you what. You can send me to prof uh, profilerpatbrown at gmail.com, profilerpatbrown at gmail.com. If you know of a podcast or something that a YouTuber that the people solved the case, let me know. And here's the thing. Um, uh, could it happen once in a while? Of course it could. But but the point being that is it is it still ethical to put everybody through tons of torture to accuse the police, to accuse the family, to accuse complete people have nothing to do with anything of stuff they never did ruin their lives because you want to be an internet sleuth, not in your own personal life. I don't have an issue with that. You know, I, you read books, you think, I wonder who did it. That's okay. But to people who are actually going out. Um, like if you look at recently at the, um, uh, um, <laughs> little girl that we're missing. Ah, I'm just blanking on her name. Uh, Oh, shoot. Somebody tell me the little girl. I just did a, sh a show on her. Okay. What's her name? <laughs> so, uh, somebody tell me her name. Um, people have been watching all those shows on her and the little, you know, she was what? Five, she's five years old, five years old. Um, and they are going into, they went to her, the church and accused the church people of doing something to her. They've accused all kinds of people of doing things to her. They've gone there in person to attack to, to talk to people and accuse them of stuff. This is unnecessary. Um, yeah, thank you, Robert Durst. Thank you. This, I have so many names in my head. I can't come up with them all when I want to. Yes, Robert Durst. Um, and um, Summer Wells. Thank you very much, Summer Wells. Okay. I did a show on Summer Wells. So, but here's what's happened. Summer Wells is a very interesting case. But what's happening is there are podcasts and there are YouTube channels that are doing the show four times a week. And they're talking about everybody in that town. And then there's the boy who did this. And then there's the boy's mother. And then there's the church people. And they are stirring up the crowds, almost like, you know, some kind of vigilante crowd to go after all these people and accuse them of killing Summer or, or kidnapping Summer or whatever they say they're doing, they did to Summer. They're all over these people in the town in real life. They're not staying at home. You know, they're either going online and trashing people or they're, uh, and they're harassing people online through emails and, and whatever they're doing, finding out their phone numbers and calling them, or they're going there in person. And this is unacceptable. If you want to sit home and ruminate, you listen to one of these you know, podcasts and you sit there, I wonder what happened. Okay, let me think. I'm not, uh, you know, that's okay. I don't have an issue with that. But to take it into real life, I think it is, is, is a fairly appalling thing. And that's what I see happening. Um, that it's, it's gotten so out of hand, just at, absolutely out of hand. Um, and, it, you know, there are times when the parents themselves cause a problem. Um, sometimes, uh, in, in certain cases, like somebody pointed out, um, uh, Madeline McCann, which I have spoken about more than once, um, and wrote a book about. The problem with the McCanns is the McCanns went public and asked for money from people. They did. They, 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 they asked for money from people to investigate their daughter's disappearance and then they abused the money so they set themselves up 
as people that were questionable in many, many ways, but especially because of that, that perhaps if they'd just been quiet and worked with the police, nobody would have, you know, they probably would have bothered them, but they wouldn't have been suspicious. But when you start going out to the public and you start getting huge amounts of cash off of the public, and then you use that in inappropriate ways and don't take any kind of, you don't account for any of it, then people start saying, wait a minute, you know, if you put yourself out there to do that, then you have to, you know, you're going to, you're, you have to be willing to stand up to the response. So um, let's, let's see what I, um, some of these things, I, I don't know some of the people that you're talking about. Um, oh, it, it helped reignite. That's the claim that things help reignite. I don't know. I'm going to have to look at that one. I'm going to take, I will take a picture of that one and see if I think it's true. Um, th th this is what this claim that by the, that's been forgotten and then it's been reignited. But the question is, it, if, if it, let's say we do the, uh, somebody does 500 more shows on, uh, uh, on um, more Murray, is that really reigniting it? Or does what happens sometimes is somebody's on their deathbed and makes a confession or, or a piece of evidence pops up, um, DNA evidence, or the body pops up. It isn't because of the, the, the podcast, it's because it just happened in real life. It just happened. So uh, I think that's, uh, oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, Nicole points out here in England, people, People have accused people of things, and it's a consequences. A man in my area was killed over false accusations. Yeah, because you 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 put the crowd. You remember the thing with uh, Frankenstein's monster, you know, and you see the whole the whole crowd from town coming up with the torches to kill him, uh, because because that's um you're 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 basically inflaming people, and that that's not necessary. Um, oh, you're saying I think the summer case is getting attention because her parents are not concerned, and frankly, are lying. Okay. Here's the point. It's getting attention because, because there are YouTubers out there who every day do a three-hour show on Summer Wells and point out 50 different people and keep her going on and on and on about it. The police already know what they know. See, this is the point. Are you helping in any way? Because the police have already talked to the Wells family. They have already talked to Candace. They've already talked to Dad. They've already talked to the boy. They've already talked to Grandma. They've done all that, and we do not even know what they're what their uh, what their um, their interviews were or their interrogations, however you want to put it, I I haven't seen the interviews. I don't know what they said in those interviews. All I had on the one broadcast I did, one the one YouTube uh, video I did, was what I saw. You know that they spoke out in public, and I commented on it. But I'm not going to go back and keep doing this for the next 50, 50 you know episodes. And that's what's inflaming people. I, I would hope that people come to my channel are learning something. It's educational. I hope they're learning something. I hope I'm not inflaming anybody. I mean, I don't want to see anybody walk out of here today and say, well, Pat Brown told me this could have happened and therefore I'm going to go investigate it or call somebody. No, I, I don't think that should be done. I think that's appalling. Um, and I don't want that to happen on anything I say. So I want the police to continue with their case. I want them to be able to do their work. I want us to understand it, but I do not want us to interfere with it. I think that's where it's getting to the point where people are interfering like you wouldn't believe. Um, and that's getting, yes. And this is um, to push institutions like prosecutors or raise the profile. Unsolved mysteries solved in many cases. Yes. And this is one of my concerns is that the prosecution, if they get a lot of pressure from the media, may decide to prosecute somebody. And I believe that's what happened in the Martha Moxley case. Huge after once um, Mark Furman wrote his book and then everybody started going crazy about it. They decided, well, you know, let, let's go, let's, let's bring them in and finish this case off. And they went there with zero evidence to put him away. And now of course they, they finally let him out of prison after 10 years and they've not, they're not going to take him back to court. You know why? Because there's no evidence and there never was any evidence linking uh, him to the crime. But because of the pressure from the public and the media, they, 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 somebody decided I'll take this to court and uh, I'll get my day in the sun, you know, because everyone wants that day in the sun, you know, uh, including the prosecutors. So it's like, yes, this is vault, it's vultures. You're correct. Uh, there are too many true crime sleuths who are vultures just picking the pace, pace apart for profit. Yes. Um, and that's why it goes on and on and on in some of these cases where, there's no good reason to do a next podcast, but yet it's done. There's no reason for another YouTube, except it's done. And it's sitting there going, okay, now we just heard about a trucker that was in the area. <laughs> and 
So then he goes, you know, there's this trucker, and he came through about the time that Mara Murray went missing. Now, now it said that he stopped at the truck stop down the way, and this is the, his name was such and such. And then everybody goes after this guy. It must be the guy that killed Mara Murray. I mean, this is the stuff that goes on, and and it's 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 not a good thing. And I'm sorry, it's just not a good thing. And you know, I don't have any, I, I, you know. I'm out here too, so I, I can't say you have no rights to, to talk about things. Uh, forever in the world, people have written books and and discussed things. I think it's my my problem is the elongated, let's get the true crime community together. It becomes a community of people who all want to solve this crime and to and to uh finally put, you know, help the family put this to rest and finally find out who victimized somebody and finally get justice. We're not capable of doing that. In, the true, in a true crime community. We're not capable. And anybody who drags us along and keeps feeding us nonsense in order to make money, because they're getting people obsessed because they make money. Don't, 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 don't question that. Because if you got 10 million downloads, you made money. <laughs> you, know, you made a shitload of money. Um, and if you get to do your own oxygen thing, you know, and you get your whole show, you're making money. Um, and I'm, I'm not against people making money. And I'm not against people making money as journalists or as true crime authors. I'm not against that. I'm against questionable ethics. And this is, this is what I think we have here. There's a lot of questionable ethics. Because, again, this is a quite simple crime. And I know some people came here expecting me to come up with something just amazing. No, the girl got in a car, decided to take a break. She drove up there. She crashed a car. She said, oh, shit. And she got in another car. And we don't know what happened. There. That's my analysis. Exciting, huh? <laughs> Exciting. Um, but that's, you know, that's, there's no more. There's, I, it, it does matter. Who cares of keeping the cases in the public eye? You, no, Joe, it does matter. They're not just keeping the cases in the public eye. They're harassing the public. They're harassing the families. They are harassing people that have nothing to do with anything. They're harassing the police. They're harassing people in such a negative way with all these accusations and complete rabbit hole theories that it's not a healthy thing. I'm sorry. That doesn't, it doesn't help. That's not how you keep it in a public eye. You know, you have a town, you've got townspeople. You can have an occasional, you know, update. You can do your one-year anniversary where the town can talk about it. Most of these cases are not solved from any distance because they happen in a specific location. So there's there's cases in my town, which, you know, I've gone on solve for, for years. Uh, for example, uh, let me say Julie Ferguson is a, is a, ca a case dear to my heart. Um, they never solved that girl's case. She was in you know, last year of high school, 17 years old, and was killed by a serial killer, I can guarantee you, and uh, came out of work one day and just vanished right off the sidewalk and was found, her body was found next day, raped and murdered right down the street. Um, beautiful young girl. Do I think it's okay for the local news to come out and say, you know, we're, we want to still find out about this case. We, 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 we want this case solved. We want to put Julie's picture up here. If anybody from 20 years ago remembers anything, you know, maybe when you were a teenager, you didn't think it had meaning, but maybe now contact the police. That's okay. But this cons, this absolute insanity we have on the internet where we're going on and on and on for years about something. And then, then, then the meet the oxygen channel who's puts out, I don't know how many shows that are questionable and content. Um, and, you know, I, I find most of the shows appalling that they're doing a true crime because they're not presenting any evidence. And they didn't present any evidence here. Six six hours of garbage, um, which was unnecessary. So, yes, I, ha I don't have a problem with letting the public know that the case is still open, respectfully saying what the police would like to know. Um, that's fine. But I think a lot of the stuff is just absolute nonsense. And I, I won't stand I won't stand back on that because, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm going to make a lot of enemies saying these kinds of things, but I, I, I believe them and I believe them strongly. And I'm not here to make, you know, I'm not here to make millions. <laughs> I'm here to tell you the truth. And uh, that's the truth. And, you know, I'm not going to stop podcasts. I'm not going to stop YouTubers. Um, I'm just hoping that somewhere along the way uh, that we perhaps have a better choice of how we approach things. And as I said, I'm not as opposed to these ladies who do these things, because at least they just telling the story and they're not. They're not milking it like I've seen some grifter types milk stuff and uh, and 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 put and do their own investigations. That's the thing. James Renner, 
did his own investigation. You know, he went out there to do his investigation. Let's let's take a look at look. Let's take a look at Oxygen Channel as well. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Where's John? Oh, well, that is okay. So James, this guy, he did a lot of investigating, and the family has. They didn't even want to talk to Oxygen because they were they were they they hated Renner so much. They're like Renner has accused us of all kinds of things. He's in, he's he's ruined our name. He's done terrible things, making all these is this investigation that he is not actually investigating properly. And then we have Oxygen comes along. They finally talk to Oxygen. You know why? Because um, Maggie, the the host, decided she would kind of go on the side of dad and actually he gave her the interview and then she talked nicely to him and so he he did that and so did some of the other kids because i think they were trying to hard to fight against uh, james renner and what he said in his book so you know but when they went out and did this oxygen channel do you think it made any difference in the finding their daughter no it didn't all it did was make money for oxygen because that's what oxygen's about making money so People are doing their investigations and they're not capable of doing proper investigations as if the police didn't do these investigations to begin with. You know, do you not think that the police did what Oxygen already did, talk to the right people, do proper interviews and all that stuff? They already did that. They just make you think that, oh, we're giving you some new information. No, yeah. Most of the time, you're not giving us anything new. <laughs> not at all. Um, Jenny says, do you think these ethical issues you're talking about harm cases? makes the job of law enforcement and prosecutors harder. Yes, I, I do, because it's, 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 it's also because of the jury problem. Because what do you think the jury does? The jury watches all this junk and they all have their, they, they, and they'll lie. They'll like, have you ever heard about the Maura Murray case? No, I don't know anything about the Maura Murray case. I've just watched 50 podcasts, but I don't know anything about the Maura Murray case. And then they go on the jury and they already have their theories that they got from people that are out there making money off of these cases. So <laughs> Pat doesn't like the oxygen channel. No, I don't. Um, I don't because I've had, I've had a bad experience myself doing the uh, Martha Moxley. I did, that was the last thing I did on television was with the Martha Moxley case. And I wasn't happy with what they did with that. Uh, then I saw the one on um, that garbage they did on uh, uh, um, um, Aruba, Aruba. <laughs> um, what's her name in Aruba? Uh, and they made it, they, somebody tell me the Aruba one. Come on, give me a name. Give me a name. <laughs> give me a name. <laughs> Aruba. And what's his face? So I just, I did, I did. It's funny because, you know, I just did a, I just did a show on that as well. Um, but, you know, I'd say so many names in my head. I can't remember them offhand. Um, but they did a whole show on that. It was like six series too. And it was complete bunch of lies. And you can go and please somebody, Natalie Holloway, thank you. God bless. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Go look at my show on Natalie Holloway and uh, you're on Vandersloot. Okay. Go look at that show and you will find that when you watch that show, you will see that I, they, they knew from the beginning that the creepy dude that was Joran's friend, the one who got stabbed to death, but yeah, he deserved, he was a psychopath and a half. Um, he claimed he knew where Natalie's body was and they spent the entire damn series saying, we think it's her body. We've got evidence that it's her, you know, human. They would lie through that whole series. And they knew the answer before the series aired, but they aired it anyway and kept people on the edge of their seat thinking that they had actually found Natalie Holloway's body because this guy knew where it was and they were going to go there. The whole thing was a charade and a fraud. So no, do I like Oxygen Channel? No, because that's what they do. And they don't have, they don't have, ethics and if they're going to do stuff like that and i see with the more murray, more murray case i didn't see any ethics in that one either they brought in a psychic at the end for god's sakes you know really a psychic to say a whole bunch of bullshit that was just not true you lost credibility right there i'm sorry if you're going to do that that's your your final answer is bring in a psychic and she'll tell us she's under a damn bridge Ugh. i tell you <clears throat> yeah okay so but uh I tried to control myself. So this is this is really something very close to my heart. And, uh, you know, I say I just I hate to see people abuse like that. And oh, by the way, if you're still here, because uh, somebody wrote the other day, she says, wow, you you sure wasted an hour of my life. Uh, <laughs> and if I did, 
I'm sorry, but if you're still here, <laughs> do like and subscribe to the channel, share the channel, and also go down and there's, uh, you can always join Patreon and then you can be part of the uh, one hour session I have every week where we, any qu I answer questions in general about profiling and analysis and anything you want. And um, also you can buy buy books down there. That got, I've got links through Amazon to those and those are ways to just support the channel. Um, so do that because the channel does need supporting because I am not going to do 40, 40 more shows on Maura Murray. I could, and then I could just really, you know, I could pull you all in and I could say, you know, what I know about Maura Murray. And it's going to take me 40 shows to tell you that, but every show I'm going to release one more piece of information. You don't know. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Pink. Oh, thank you. Just became a patron today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's this, um, I'm hoping to keep this up. Uh, most of my shows aren't going to be so volatile, uh, but, you know, I didn't go into this expecting this to be so. Somebody said you ought to look at the Maura Murray case. And I do follow what you all ask for. Um, and I make my long list of things I can look at. Um, and and I, I try to get through them. Next week, I'm going to be doing um, Jeremy Bamber uh, and David Bain. I think that's correct. Jeremy Bamber is the, the guy who was uh, supposedly killed his whole family in, in, in the U.K., and people have been trying to get him out saying he didn't do it, that it was really his schizophrenic sister who killed everybody and he was railroaded. And then David Bain, who did the same thing in New Zealand, and he did get out. Uh, there was a rugby player there who just fought his whole case and got him out. And his claim is that his dad was the one that killed the whole family. Now, in both cases, the, the ones that they're blaming are dead and can't can't fight back. So I'm going to do a show on family annihilation and the Bamber case and the Bain case. Um, and, you know, what are the likelihood of they were properly charged and convicted? And what what is it about family annihilators? How do they actually work? Um, and so that will be the show for next week. Um, so most of the time I don't go on rants about true crime shows. But uh, <laughs> when I got into more Murray, I mean, I, I was just going to look at somebody said it was just an interesting show from from, you know, way back. And then I came across True Crime Addict and I came across Oxygen Channels and I you know, that these were the two most popular along with the podcasts um, done by the two podcasters. And there are other blogs and podcasts on the show. But these were like the ones that made the money, the, these two and the, the two guys in the Oxygen show. Um, and so I said, well, you know, to be fair, I should read the book and I should watch the show and see whether they can impress me with the fact that they're doing something useful and they are not being abusive and unethical and that I come away thinking, hmm, good job. And I have occasionally done that, by the way. I thought The Jinx was probably one of the better shows I ever saw. Um, uh, that was actually a, a uh, was actually a production that went, not a bad production. The Jinx was probably one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, so can it be done? It can. There are shows that can, can do a pretty good job. Unfortunately, my experience with Oxygen has been very poor. My own personal experience and the shows I've seen and I don't think they stand strongly behind their ethics and uh, or, or don't have any. I don't know what the problem is. I think they just like making money. And that's true for a lot of uh, shows and channels. So sometimes you can make money just because you, you, you write a good book and you people love your book and you make a lot of money and it's well deserved. And I'm not going to fault you if you happen to write a fabulous true crime book and, a, and you make a half a mil uh, or you do a great show like The Jinx and it happens to be very successful. Or you're, you're one of the ladies I just showed you with the true crime shows that they're not my style. They're not something I watch, but I understand why people watch them. And they're not doing a terrible thing. I don't see them being unethical. I just see that they're, the information is limited on those shows. And I, that's why I keep telling you, you got to know that these are limited piece, a bunch of information they're getting from the general information out there. They're not getting it from... As I say, if you're going to do a show on Madeleine McCann and you haven't read my book and you haven't read Amaral's book and you haven't read the police files, you're just doing what the tabloids have said. You're just doing a show saying, oh, I read this in all the tabloids and here's what happened. I read it on Wikipedia. You know, <laughs> I, I don't look at Wikipedia as some kind of, a, oh, this is great information. I might get some information from it, but I'm not thinking that's necessarily useful information outside of the basic facts. So a lot of the tabloids, they, they'll tell you the day that Madeleine McCann went missing. They'll tell you the day Maura Murray went missing. But that doesn't tell you the details of what the police investigation did and what makes sense and all of that stuff. So when you do a one-hour show, 
just talking about the general case. You just go into it knowing that's what they're doing. They're not milking it forever and ever and ever. I don't know that they're being unethical. They're just telling you the basics of the story from the, the easily accessed information out there. So that's my that's my theory on that. Um, so at <laughs> any rate, uh, oh, that's Lisa says, thank you for looking at family annihilators. A very interesting one. It isn't the usual father taking everyone out. And that that is actually an interesting point because most of the time we think of family annihilators as fairly young men they have a nice, good-looking wife and a couple nice kids. And one day they get up and they kill them all off and they go off with some honey, you know. <laughs> and that is actually the more common family annihilator. But with the Bamber and Bane case, that is not what we're looking at. So it's it's rather fascinating. Uh, uh, Adam, oh, yeah, I, I have not, you know, here. Yes. Okay. Interesting you point this one out. And I'm going to look at this case. The other big case for publicity is, Ad, Ad, I can't pronounce his name, Adnan Syed, because if you've seen the show, you probably know how. The murder of Haylin May. Um, yeah, this was one of the biggest podcast shows ever that brought the kind of true crime stuff out there. And and I have a feeling I'm going to not probably have necessarily a very fine attitude toward that either, because again, it's look, it's it's starting to dig up every little piece of information. And I put quotes around that. Somebody said this, and this could have happened. And, and then, then, then there was this, and then there was that. And it's not, the problem is when you get all that information and you're not the police who have actually interviewed and gone through the materials, you get a very slanted idea of things and what you think could have happened. Um, and it's not necessarily has any validity. And that's the problem with these shows. And people get into them and start thinking, Yes, this is, they're proving that this person is innocent, for example. I know that a lot of people think he didn't do it. Um, I'll have to look at the case. I, I, you know, I have it on my list. I will look at the case and see whether, Serial, that, yes, that was the name of it. That's correct. Serial. Um, um, so that's, you know, so anyway, Serial, uh, yeah, that's, that's, and it was very well, I mean, people love that. People love it. I mean, but the question is, is it true? And this is one of the things we're finding that happens. Uh, we're going to see it in the Bamber and Bain case next week as well. You get high profile people who have money and they get, you get high profile lawyers and they all get together and they start presenting an alternative theory to what happened. Alternative theory. So the evidence is all over here, but what you start doing is adding stuff over here that you say, this could have happened. And then maybe this could have happened. And instead of saying this didn't happen, you say, maybe it did happen. And you start confusing people. That's the, that is the job of defense attorneys is to confuse people, hopefully in a court of law where then they can get their client off. But what's happening is they're confusing people out in the media. So then the media gets hold of it. Social media gets hold of it. And you start confusing people all over the place as to what actually happened. And people start believing stuff because they do not have experience in investigations. So to say that something happened, like the like the, the tandem theory, there's no evidence of the tandem theory at all that, that Renner comes up with. I don't make a damn bit of sense. But he's decided this is a good theory. He's not an investigator. He's not a profiler. He's a, a journalist, you know, that's what he's doing. He's writing. He's a writer. And he's done his investigations. And he's decided that, oh, I have a tandem theory. Well, there's no evidence of it. So the problem is people are believing it. There's a probably now, I don't know, thousands of people out there who believe in the tandem theory because James Renner presented it and they're like, oh man, God, I think that's what happened too. <sighs> and that's what defense lawyers do. They they come up with theories to confuse the jury because a jury, the juries in the United States, they're civilian juries. They have no training. They're not detectives. They're not profilers. They're not crime analysts. They're just people off a bus stop. <laughs> I always call it the people off the bus stop. They're brought in and they're confused. And somebody says, well, you know, you can't convict this guy because it might have been a tandem car. And they go, you know, I guess it could be a tandem car. Maybe that is what happened. So that's how things go back. <sighs> so. Hmm. So anyway, uh, I don't know about Joe blowing his stuff here. A police came up with a tandem theory. Well, it's all over Renner's book. It, be, that would be, we understand something because it's in a it's in a news article. Oh, a news article because they always tell the truth, Joe. First of all, there is a difference between a theory that you consider and a theory that you accept. Okay, I can consider a tandem car theory, especially in the beginning of the crime. You can say, well, you know, maybe somebody picked up that she knew. 
Does that mean Pat Brown thinks that somebody picked her up that she knew? No, it doesn't. It means that to be open and fair at the beginning of an investigation, you don't want to close things down. You want to make sure that, you know, you don't screw that up. I, I didn't even look at it, you know, that like the bus driver, the, the guy that people thought maybe the bus driver, oh my God, I got my something to drink here. Hmm. Maybe the bus driver did something to her. Was he a suspect? Well, he was there. Did the police consider him a suspect? I would say they considered him a person of interest. Now, of course, he had the, his wife called the police right away. So it's kind of weird that he would have the police come if he wanted to do something to her. So, but I'm sure, to be fair, they should look at him. They should look at him. Absolutely. So you you look at him. That That's a theory. It doesn't mean it's a theory that you give much credence to. So, and you get the news people. First of all, you can't believe the news people because here's what happens. News people go like this. So do you think, I heard that you thought it might be a tandem car theory. And the, and the cop goes, well, you know, we're looking at everything. Oh, the police said it could be a tandem car theory. That's how it works. I have had so many things said that I said that aren't necessarily true. People say, well, Pat Brown said, I'm like, where did you get that from? Well, I saw it on, on, on a, in a show. Well, yeah, because they edited my words and they cut out half of what I said. <laughs> it isn't what I said. No, it's not Keontae. It's just, it's just Diet Pepsi. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, what the hell? I don't know who you are, but cops never tell the truth. Most are murderers by action or association that cover for each other. I hope you're not following me because <clears throat> if that's the way you look at the world, that's just a, that's a sad thing because there's a lot of good cops in the world. There's a lot of good detectives in the world and I stand behind them. I'm not saying there aren't occasions where you got a bad apple and you do. And I've spoken up about those. So don't, don't think that I won't, I, you know, I've, there's cases. And if you, if you go and you watch my case on the uh, Superbike murders, it's one of my videos, type in Superbike murders, Pat Brown and come on my channel and you'll come up with, I went against that sheriff's department. Crooked, crooked and crooked. Okay. I will speak up on those rare cases. However, to sit there and just say blanket, oh, this, you know, hey, this girl goes missing in New Hampshire, so they lied about everything and they did something to her. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. That's ridiculous. Uh, that they didn't do the best investigation possible? Hey, you know, here, here's the thing, folks. Especially in small towns, you just may not have that much training. You may have the simple fact that you haven't seen this before and you do the best you can. Now, let's say you go to a doctor. You, you just say, I don't feel real well. I got some, a really strange feeling in my stomach. They start doing tests and they do about a bunch of tests. They tell you, well, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. The cat scan, can, cat scan came back clean. And then you die of cancer six months later because you had cancer. Do you think the doctor was out to get you? Do you think the doctor wanted to do bad work and so you die or just the test didn't work out or maybe he never experienced a certain thing. Maybe he wasn't the best doctor, but you not that he was out to kill you, you know, and most, most cops want to catch bad guys. They want to find, they have, you know, the family comes in. These are the police officers, the detectives who sit down with the family or the sheriff and they have to look this family in the eye and the family is devastated. They're crying, going, please find my daughter. That's my, my daughter. Find my daughter. Do you think they want to screw the case up? Come on now. This is just, this is silly. They want to find the girl. They couldn't find her. Now what happens is this, let's say she jumped in somebody's car and they took her down the highway, 50 miles. They went off the highway. They raped and murdered her. And she's in, she's in some gully someplace in the New Hampshire mountains. They just can't find her body. What are the police supposed to do? You think they're magicians? They've got no evidence. They took the dogs out. They think she got in a car. That's the entire evidence they have. Other than that, nobody, no, no, no person, no suspect to look at because if the guy was just passing by, they're screwed. They got nothing. Do you think that they don't, they're not miracle workers. They do what they can do. And sometimes you can't do anything. So just like people who watched the show tonight, well, you know, Pat Brown, I've seen some of her analyses are really detailed and she really gets into it. And now they're like, I'm disappointed in her. I guess she doesn't care about Maura Murray because, you know, all she had to say was 
She took a ride and disappeared. What kind of profiler is she anyway? Well, I'm a profiler who doesn't have any more evidence to work with. <laughs> That's why, you know, it's all I've got. So, you know, um, yeah. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, Anna Karina, thank you. Hi, Pat. I love the way you allow yourself to speak. You speak your mind in a logical way. I've been waiting for this channel for ages. So happy you're finally here. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, in tele when I've done television for like 15 years of it, um, I only got a soundbite. And some people will say, you know, she doesn't shut up now. <laughs> she goes on and on and on. You know, it's because I can. And I know sometimes maybe it's too much and people just wander off, you know, but my whole point is to get the information across and to be able to explain where normally you don't get a chance to explain. I mean, you just don't. Uh, so this is, this is one opportunity to do it. And I hope people get something out of it. And if they don't, they leave and maybe, you know, they got enough after a certain point and they go off. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just hope people learn from it. I, I really do. Um, so yes, I do. I, I, Yes, Nicole, I do know Isabella McFadden. Yes, I do. Yes, um, definitely. Especially in the early days of Madeline McCann, I'm very, very familiar. Very familiar. Um, so what's, I'm curious about what you have to say. I do agree with you in the McCann case. Mr. Amaral has my respect too. Yeah, you know, um, oh, from Brazil. Yay. I just I love people from other places than just the U.S. coming and hanging out. And if you have a Brazilian case, I will take a look at it because I like looking at things around the world. Um, I love what you're saying. Oh, here's, here's the point. Okay. I love what you're saying, but I also believe malpractice does exist. Example, they never got more Mora's phone records from UMass. Okay. Now here's the, here's the thing, you, you know, it's the Monday, Monday, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking issue that somebody decides you, you didn't do everything you could have done. And I'm not going to say that they couldn't have done more. And maybe there was something they didn't do. But I'm going to tell you, I don't think her, that probably made no difference. The problem they had was that the, the case itself was pretty clear to them probably in the beginning that, you know, she crashed the vehicle, she got out and she vanished. So that, that's what I keep saying. I don't even care what happened back in University of Massachusetts. I mean, what, what that she was going to meet somebody up there and, and then that they came and got her and all this kind of stuff. Should they have looked at that? Okay, they should have. But the time frame and when she went missing kind of gets rid of that whole concept. Uh, if she was going to meet somebody, you don't meet somebody on a back road that you happen to meet when you crashed your car. You meet somebody because you go someplace to meet them. Let's say she was going to a cabin somewhere or she was going to go to a hotel and meet them. I, I'm not objecting to, they should find that out, but but that probably is not the reason she disappeared. So, you know, so it's like, you can go on and on about all the things, oh, they didn't do this and they didn't do that and they didn't do this. Does it help? Does it really make a difference? And I wouldn't call that malpractice either. I mean, you know, uh, it's just, and I don't know how much we know about everything too. Uh, sometimes you hear things, uh, they didn't do this and maybe they did much more than you think they did and you just don't know it because it hasn't been released to the public. So I'm also, I say, be very cautious about that because you heard it in the news, because you heard it in a book, because you heard it in a podcast, doesn't make it true. And I know that because I've worked cases where I've been told by the family what happened. <laughs> I've been told by the family what the police didn't do. I've seen in the media what the police didn't do. Guess what? When I get there and I read the records, the police done did it. You know, I'm like, yeah, here it is. I can't go back and tell them anything either because I'm working on the inside. So I'm not going to go back to the family and say, or the media and say, oh no, the police did do that because maybe there's a reason they didn't bring it out to the public. So I do not know. Um, and therefore, when I get information from <laughs> out there, I don't take everything for it to be absolutely correct. And that's why there's a problem when you when you go on and you start claiming that these things are true and then going further with it. I mean, there are things we know about this case which are pretty obvious. Uh, we can go with that. And there's cases which I've looked at where the physical evidence does exist and behavioral evidence does exist. Um, for example, you go back to the Summer Wells case we have statements from the mother and her father that were, they were at least, you know, in, in public, they gave long statements. Um, 
And there's other things that we know are, are true. But then there's a lot of things in that case which are garbage, like Summer was dead in the car because you can see by the video and that they took in the car and then the photo that she's dead. This is nonsense crap. This is There's no truth in this. And yet it went all over the internet and became a big, huge thing. So, yeah. Uh, when does a case like Morris go cold? This is a good question. When does it go cold with the law enforcement? You know, the first 48 is, is always pointed out as being the most important thing because you once you get past that, it's hard to get evidence. And then what happens is this. You keep trying and you try and you try and you try and your leads just vanish into no place. You just can't come up with anything more and you know you can't. And so a lot of times what will happen is Law enforcement will tell, this is a famous line, that any family of a murder victim or missing person's uh, case, a child or something, will hear. They'll go, well, what's happening? You know, we've been trying to get a hold of you. We've been calling you every day. And finally, we get hold of you. What's happening? What's happening with the case? And the police say these famous words. We're working on it. What does that mean? Well, if it's been a while, they're probably not really working on it. They probably filed it on the shelf. It's not that they don't want to work on it. It's just they have nowhere to go. So what they're hoping for is that one day somebody's going to trip over her body and they'll have a body. They're hoping one day somebody will say something and they'll get a tip. They're hoping that one day there's a deathbed confession. But at a certain point, there's nothing else you really can do. And, and there's a thing called finances. You know, people think that you could spend like, like, a, like a huge amount of man hours and a huge amount of money when there's no evidence to go on. What are you going to, how are you going to spend all that money and manpower? You have other cases. You've got other things to do. You cannot have a hundred police officers working on this case, a hundred detectives in this tiny little town running around the roads doing what? You know, you can't have, you can have search parties, but at a certain point, you can't afford the search parties anymore and you don't know where to look anymore. So this is, this is where in a, in a, in a perfect world where money were no object, and you had all the time and you could put like every single resource to this one case. Yeah, but it's not reality. You can't do that. So they pursue the leads they have. They do the searches they can do. And at a certain point, they go, Damn, I don't know what happened to her. I don't know what to tell the parents. We can't find her. We can't. We've, we've already gone through all the houses in the neighborhood. We've done we interviewed three or four hundred people. We got nothing. Because, you know, if a guy picked her up on that road and drove her away and did something to her, they're never going to get that anything unless this. They find her body and the guy's dropped his, you know, his, his uh, driver's license on top of her. Or he left DNA and they put it into the CODIS bank and it matches some guy who they just picked up a year ago for something. And they finally solved the case through DNA. Yeah. Or some guy's in jail and he says, I killed Maura Murray and he actually can tell you where her body is they'll solve the case. But barring that, how many hours do you spend on something you can't find anything about? And so now, mind you, private investigators will milk clients. I'm not saying all private investigators. So if you're one of them, don't say, I don't do that. Many private investigators will have no issue with running down every stupid lead that isn't a lead. They'll put, because they're getting paid by the hour. If you're getting 50, 100, $200 an hour, Hey, I'll run down the damn milkman. You know, somebody said they saw, you know that place on the mountain where they all went up to because of the, you know, whatever coordinates they had? Hell, you're going to pay me? I'll take a hiking trip up the mountain. That'll take me all day long. That'll be 10 hours right there. And I got to get down the mountain. Okay, so we're gonna, maybe we have to camp. And then I'll come down the next day and that'll be 20 hours. And 20 hours at $100 now. Oh, I make $2,000. Yeah, I'll go up the mountain, you know. <laughs> I'll do, I'll check out everything for you. And after you spent $20,000 and I have nothing for you, you know, I never got you any information, but for $20,000, I'll check, I'll check shit out. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on releasing public records at that point? I think this is a good question. Um, I have often thought about this and let me point out what I think about this. Cause I, th th there is a point where you almost wonder uh, whether there should be a, a point in time, let's say 10 years, if a decade goes by and you haven't figured it out, that the family is permitted to bring in a, oh, or, or whoever has to bring in an outside group, uh, three, three people to analyze that aren't 
beholden to the police department. And at that point, they're allowed to look through everything that ever was. This The way I've done some cold cases, I've been walked into cold cases and been able to look. Now, what's interesting is most of the time I can't tell the public anything because I came in under you know, auspices of the police. So I can go in and say, Jesus Christ, they screwed this case up, <laughs> you know, um, and they should have been after this guy. So in a sense, if there was an outside agency who came in and did that and were not beholden, they could bring forth to the public whether the police failed to do the job properly, uh, whether it was impossible to do the job because it just was no evidence, uh, whether the police did have the right guy but couldn't prove it for a court of law. But here comes the problem with that. And, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I have mixed feelings. One part of me thinks that they need some kind of accountability, some kind of oversight so that they can't just get away with either poor work or whatever, or, you know, somebody gets to know something at some point. There's an accountability process. So I'm kind of for that. On the other hand, <laughs> the other problem is that since people are irrational and unreasonable, I've worked some cases where I, you know, I know the police did their best and they just, it, it's just the way it is. But I'm going to tell you, if, if I had released that information to the public, they would have been skewered. Everybody would have lost their jobs. Uh, people in the community would have been harassed and, and threatened and all kinds of things. And you're releasing the name of, of persons of interest and 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 putting putting them out there for the 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 public to to, to go after them. So it's that's kind of a, an, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's it, I don't know how we'd work it. I I, I like the concept of accountability, uh, an oversight. I don't know how we'd work it so that the family would get some oversight and the public would get to know whether things were handled properly or whether there's an issue that should be dealt with without releasing everything to the public in such a way that would be detrimental to either the case or to the people that were involved. Uh, you know, so good question. What? Uh, okay. This is what about PIs that do it pro bono for 17 years? Okay. Joe, it's a fair question. There are PIs who, I mean, I work pro bono for a good portion of my career. Um, and people will say there's two reasons. One is because I truly care about solving cases. And I'm going to say that's true. Uh, also, it gave me a lot of experience because the police departments often don't want to pay an outside person and they won't. They don't have funding. So I paid out of my own pocket. I paid for the flight. I paid for the hotel. I paid for the rental car. I give up a week worth of, you know, being in that town and the hotels. Uh, and then I have to come home and work. I never charge for my services. I, I learned a tremendous amount and I'm hoping to use that, you know, in continuing to, to educate and to develop uh, methodologies for, for detectives in profiling. So all of what I've learned and done for free for them and has cost me a lot of money has advantages for my own career and my own studies and my own research. Now, there are other people who are going to say, you just did it for the publicity. <laughs> well, guess what? Because I did a lot of these things as pro bono, I did get on television. I did end up on television for 15 years. Did I get publicity? And the answer is yes. So can we, we're, we it's going to be, some, there's always a mixed, there's mixed, you know, people are not actually just, I did it for exactly this reason. People have mixed motives. Just to be fair, they have mixed motives. Um, so so a PI who does this for free, it could be because he has a heart for the family. It could be because it bugs him. It's just one of those cases that he just wants to, he just wants to know what happened. He wants to help the family. That may be true. And I'm okay with that. I think that's fabulous. But there are other PIs who do this because it gains them tremendous publicity. And that makes them earn a lot of other money for other cases that they're working on, brings in customers and clients. It gets them on television. It gets them books. Everybody's got motives, and I'm not here to say specifically whose motive is what. Uh, so, to me, as long as you're being ethical about it, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. If you if you make some money off a book you wrote, if you make some money off of you know you're a PI and you've done some great work and you get some new clients, I'm not gonna. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not gonna go after you for that. If you if you're really smart and you've done so much work and the, and a show comes along and wants you to talk, I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, I, you know, I'm not here to judge everybody's motive, but when it gets out of hand, that's that's all I'm trying to bring up, that a lot of times it does get out of hand and it's it's really questionable why people are doing what they're doing and it's damaging. And that that's what I talk about. 
Uh, oh, that, oh, that's a good question. Um, how are cold case units succeeding? Very poorly. Um, cold cases almost never get solved. So don't believe it. Um, people love the cold case stuff. You know how they get solved? DNA. It's DNA. I've worked so many cold cases. They don't get solved by my brilliance. <laughs> they don't because the evidence is missing. Um, and if you read the book, it's in the link below, uh, the profiler, um, you'll find that out. Uh, so the problem is, you know, when the evidence is long gone, the evidence is long gone. And so most of the time when you hear about a cold case unit, oh, we're working on these cold cases, what they're doing is going through the cases, hoping to find like something that wasn't tested for DNA. And they're hoping that if it hadn't been tested in the last you know, 20 years, and maybe now that piece of clothing or whatever, there's new DNA technology, it'll match something. And also maybe 20 years ago, the dude who committed the crime wasn't worried about DNA. And so therefore he was careless. And then now you can match him to DNA and he's in, he's in, you know, he's in prison for something else and you can match it to him and you solve an old case. That's his, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, but most of the time it's through DNA. Um, rarely is it through something else. Um, so, uh, you know, the concept that you have a cold case unit and they go through everything and then they start investigating all over again and they, they solve the case through brilliant, you know, Sherlock Holmes investigative work is rare. I'm not saying it can happen. And when it does happen, it's fabulous, but it's pretty darn rare. So just really, really rare. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. The serial killer put away in UK by DNA first murder conviction was released on parole. They released a serial killer on parole. Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, you know, one off crime is different. Uh, you know, a guy goes in, he robs a liquor store, and his intention was just to scare the, the, the owner of the liquor store, and he and, he, and the owner fought back, and he freaked out, and he shot the guy and killed him. That kind of one-off crime, okay, you know, you let the guy out after 15, 20 years. I, I, you know, I can see that, you know, he's not, a, you know, maybe it wasn't planned, wasn't to kill anybody. It was just, you know, he shouldn't have done what he did. But a serial killer... That's every intention of killing everybody he kills. I don't understand why he ever sees the light of day ever again. I think that's disgusting and very, very upsetting. Um, oh yes, this is this is a good point. Um, the the DNA genealogy detectives are amazing. Yeah, they're doing some really fascinating things with connecting the guy who committed the crime with a family member and you know working their way through. That is really cool. Um, and and again, DNA stuff. Um, Really, 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 really neat stuff. And so there are ways uh, to go back and sometimes solve an old crime. But again, it's usually DNA and uh, nothing wrong with that. You know, nothing wrong with something that works. <laughs> if it works, it works. Let me see if there's anything else here. Um, okay, that's interesting. Canadian police don't seem to release as many details on the cases as they do in the U.S. Yeah, um, there's some places that are very, very much closed and you, they, the media doesn't get to say anything. And even if the guy gets arrested, uh, that, you know, we, the U.S., I, I don't like what the U.S. does. So, so the guy gets arrested and then the defense attorney goes on Nancy Grace and starts saying how the, his guy's innocent. And then, you know, everybody starts talking about it. And by the time it goes to trial, it's like it's been tried in, in the media instead of in the court. Uh, I, I don't, I don't go with that. So, uh, you know, I, I think again, that's unethical. Uh, so I think that when they arrest somebody that, that they should have a media blackout right there. Um, and, and what should be released to the public? And I'll say this over and over again, the public really has no business knowing everything that the police know. The only thing the police should release is stuff that will truly, truly help something that will help the public identify who the killer is or give specific information that would lead to the killer. Not every single detail in life needs to be known by the public. I mean, it's not under damn business. You know what I mean? It's just not our business. Um, and if it's not, if it's not relevant to the crime. And I think that there's too much just, you know, voyeurism involved as opposed to we want, really want the crime solved. So um, really, really, Oh, Colin Pitchfork. That's who it was, huh? Colin Pitchfork murdered two teenage girls and now he's out. I'll have to look at that. That's creepy. That's, 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 that's really sad. Let me see if there's anything else here before I, before I take off. I said something good. Uh, uh, well, there you go. There's the problem. Uh, who can perform oversight of the local LA, the FBI or the state? Neither one. And I'll tell you why. Because they all work together. Uh, they may not always like each other, but you're not, you're not stabbing each other in the back is not really going to help. You know, so you come in, and then that's one reason that a police department, if you, if the police department had a preference, an FBI profiler or Pat Brown, 
they'll pick the FBI profiler every time. Not because they think Mr. FBI profiler is better at doing the job, but the FBI profiler, they can be sure won't say anything. But Pat Brown, bit of a loose cannon, you know? I mean, I've cut, I've kept my mouth shut about a great many cases I've worked with police and I don't say anything. But there's that case, as I say, South Carolina, check it out, you know, uh, super bike murders. Um, I was, I spoke up on that case because I found them unethical and I, I, I did not, I could not st keep silent because I was appalled by what I saw them doing and what they were saying. And they, they convicted a guy or they gave him a plea deal. Uh, uh, he confessed to the, the, the quadruple murder, of uh, super bike. And there was no evidence that he committed that crime. And they, the lies that were told to pretend that he committed that crime were appalling. And I have proof of that. And so I spoke up, but the FBI probably wouldn't have spoken up, you see, or the state wouldn't have spoken up. They'd all get together and talk because everybody has a career to save and a department to save. And so, I mean, you know, this is what gives people suspicion a lot of times about police agencies that, oh yeah, they're just out, you know, to, to, to have each other's back. Well, to some extent, there's a truth to that, but, you know, because you could take the whole agency down and the media is so ruthless. They're not looking for the truth either. You know, so, so if there's any little fracture, then, then the media comes in and will try to destroy you uh, or whoever will try to destroy you. And, and, you know, lots of people will lose their livelihoods and, is it deserved or not deserved? It depends. It depends. And it's, you know, unfortunately, you know, I can't say on each one of those whether they deserved it or not. I have my opinions on certain cases, but, you know, not necessarily in other ones. So, what murder? Yes, we're, yes, Superbike Forever Young. The murders in South, yeah, South Carolina, Superbike. The Todd Colehep was the guy that they have now said committed Superbike, and he did not. And if you go find my video on it, I did a whole thing on that. Um, and I also have uh, a whole bunch of uh, blogs on that. Um, and you can put in Superbike. Um, it's called, um, it's called, uh, I, I read it on the internet because the sheriff had the gall to say I never worked on the case and that everything I knew about the case was something I read on the internet. So I read, I wrote three blogs called, I read it on the internet. And then I gave details of the case. And I said, and that's because I read it on the internet. And there were so many, so many shots fired as I read on the internet. And there, <laughs> so some people were looking at the blogs and going, what's wrong with this woman? Why does she keep saying she read everything on the internet? But anybody who knew the story was laughing because they knew exactly what I was talking about, that the, the sheriff had lied about me. And after I wrote that, then he had to come back and he said, okay. So she was here. She didn't read it on the internet. <laughs> but there's that was, that was a bunch of crooked stuff going on there, unfortunately. Um, and again, let me let me be fair. The um, the Spartanburg Sheriff's Department doesn't mean that every case they worked, they were crooked. It doesn't mean that every detective that worked on the cases was a bad detective. I don't have an issue with everybody. I have an issue with the sheriff. Sheriff Wright, who I do not find to be an ethical human being, and I believe he's a liar, and so are a couple of the people associated with him, and also the prosecutor, uh, because they all were willing to give a plea deal to a guy who did not commit the crime in order to close that crime down. And so I will speak up against certain things because, because it bothers me. But it doesn't mean everybody in that uh, that agency is bad. So, you know, it's, it's, so I'm not trying to take the entire department down and every detective is horrible and every detective is just crooked. No, there. But, you know, sometimes you get a bad detective. Sometimes you get a bad police officer or a bad sheriff. It happens. Uh, but it doesn't mean everybody's bad. And so let's just be rational and reasonable about that. Um, so just be fair. <laughs> so, oh, that happened. Wow, really? Superbike in South Carolina happened in my family member's jurisdiction. Yeah, it was it was a huge crime. I mean, a really crazy crime. So for just those who don't know, Superbike, a guy walked into a motorcycle shop in broad daylight and shot down all four people that worked there. Shot down the owner, the co the the, the co owner manager guy. Shot down the owner's mother who was like the the she did administrative work and then shot down the guy who was working on the motorcycles in the back who'd only worked there like a couple weeks um and they never figured out who did it for like 13 years i was brought in i analyzed it i had a good suspect but when cod colehep lived in town um was a serial killer and he was caught with a girl in his backyard in a in a um, container truck and he had killed her boyfriend and he'd killed another couple 
So he was a serial killer. They basically made a deal that if he that if he confessed to the superbike crimes, he wouldn't get the death penalty on the other ones. <laughs> Todd Cole is like, well, it works for me. You know? And then he told the story about what happened and it was complete garbage. So so go look at the show I did on Superbike. It's fascinating. And there are links below and that to all the blogs I wrote about that particular case. And it was a huge travesty, huge travesty. So anyway, I am going to sign off here. So somebody doesn't say, God, she was on for five hours. Uh, so next week, Bambert and uh, Bain will talk about um, uh, uh, familial uh, uh, annihilation, uh, getting rid of your entire family in one fell swoop. Why do you do that? And uh, how do you get away with doing that? Or do you, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that. So anyway, again, like, subscribe, share, go down to the links. Get butter. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody takes me overly seriously, this is not a big money maker. I just think it's funny. Uh, and it, it really does make good better. It's amazing. It's an amazing product, but I'm, I'm, I'm lucky if I make five cents off of it. So, <laughs> but I still think it's cool. Uh, so, but do, uh, do uh, follow the channel and share and, and, and let me know what you're interested in me, you know, focusing on because I will only do, a show once so you can you can i can guarantee you that i'm not here to milk milk these uh particular crimes and to lead people on into you know solving things uh but i will do each crime one time and the only reason i'd ever do something twice is because something extraordinarily unusual happened and it, it's something really worthwhile talking about uh you know that you know maybe something shocking like the person i thought did it didn't do it or there, there was some kind of huge update after 30 years. It was fascinating. Um, then I might do a second show. But other than that, you know, I'm not going to be talking about Maura Murray again. There's no reason to. Uh, I've said what I have to say. I hope everybody's learned from it. And I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, do 30 shows and, and go through all kinds of clues so you can help solve the crime. You can't, you know, <laughs> nobody here can. And even I can't. And so, I'm leaving it to the police department. Uh, would I love to lurk some of these crimes I talk about? I'd love to work on the crimes. Uh, sometimes I think if only I could analyze the crime from inside and see all the records and all the interviews and all the evidence, maybe I could help the police look at a direction that they hadn't looked at. Maybe they overlook something and it's nice to have an outside opinion, especially a profiler. Do I like doing that? Yes, I do. But unless I'm inside the police department being able to analyze everything, I'm out here with you guys and I only have so much information as well. So unless I can really be sure that that information is accurate, that's the only thing I'm, I'm going to go on. And the rest of the stuff, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my time nitpicking over stuff. And so we can all ruminate over, you know, maybe that bus driver. <laughs> it's just not fair. So, uh, so somebody says, uh, oh, Colin, Colin Pitchfork would be a good case to look at. I'll check that one out. I will. And thank you, Mary, and thank you very much. And uh, you're all awesome. I'm glad you're here. You asked great questions today. And um, so, cool. I'll see you uh, next week. And if you're with Patreon, I'm going to do a show this week um, on Wednesday at 3 o'clock. It's the live show for the Patreon people uh, who are friends of Pat Brown profiling. And you can ask all the questions. If you can't make it, I'm doing it early this, uh, this, this, uh, this week because I'm going to give my UK people a chance to be awake because I've been doing it at 7.30 and it doesn't really work for UK and i got a lot of UK people. So this week I'm doing it at three in the afternoon, Eastern time. It'll be, I think it's 9 p.m. your time in the UK or eight. So if you're part of uh, the Patreon group, uh, I'll see you there at three o'clock. And then the next following week, we'll be back to 7.30 again. And uh, if you're in a time zone that doesn't fit either one of those, let me know. <laughs> let me know. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, help people be involved and so i just have to know and then yeah, send in your questions if you're part of patreon and you're on that you're you've joined that level you can send in questions and even if you can't make the show i'll try to answer your questions and uh so anyway i will see those of you on wednesday and i'll see the next rest of you next sunday and um i hopefully will not have a whole bad bunch of reaction off of this show and I'm, I'm thinking some people are not going to be happy with me. So I'm looking forward to my unpleasant email. <laughs> but just know how it works like this. In my emails, I have a thing called delete. I just go by. And if you come to my YouTube channel, 
then I then I just block you from the channel because you may disagree with me and you may not appreciate what I have to say, but I will tell you one thing. I will never go to your podcast and attack you. I will never go to your channel and attack you. I will never go to your Amazon page and attack you. I will only say what I have to say here. And so if you don't like me, feel free to say whatever you want about me someplace else. <laughs> but this is my home. My channel is my home. My Facebook page is my home. My Twitter page is my home. And, and my emails are my home. So if you come there and attack me, I'm just going to go, bye, see you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> anyway, good night, everybody. Is it night? Oh my God, it's getting dark here. Okay, uh, see you all on Wednesday or on Sunday. Bye. And I'm going to be here a while because I'm trying to figure out. It's hard to manage a show when it's live. You got to try to figure out how to hit things, and you're you're always on the wrong page when you're trying to do it. So, any rate, um, yeah, I can't I can't find what I'm doing here. Oh, I love I love a fast uh, really fancy ending. Okay, here's the ending of my show. <laughs> Bye.